Side note, Maria, you are right. It does not initially describe the picture on the book, but what I meant, more importantly, that that's was not my argument, though. What my, I was saying that once he hands it to the assistant after the point takes is, it from though, him, then he sees it. The <gasps> point is, the point is, is that when it is first described, you know what I knew is, what yes, it was. But yes. When he first picked it up, he couldn't see it. He hands it to the assistant, then it describes yes, you are it on right. the cover. You are right. Oh! One time, one of our first memories is Maria misremembering the beginning to the the Amulet of Zarnarkan books, and she was like, I'm right about this, and I was right, actually, and that's the one time that's happened, and so I still like bringing it up. Oh my god, that must have felt so goddamn liberating, Will. No, but it was, it was so, it was so early in our friendship that it, uh, it wouldn't have the same, like, if that happened now, I think the value of it would be worth so much more than it's like the only <laughs> time it's happened. No, 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 I still hold on to it warm in my heart in dark moments. And welcome to another episode of your favorite podcast, Unresolved Textual Tension. It's me, your host, Maria. And with me today, my handsome bitches, Katie and William. Ooh, so handsome, Ooh. so bitchy. And Ooh. maybe, maybe I'm a dog person. We'll see by the end of this video. And you oh guys just God. can't see it because of your expectations. Oh <laughs> And uh, Katie, what book are we doing today? The book that wouldn't burn. By who, Katie? By who? Who's the author? Do you know no. what the author's yes. name is? It's Mark Lawrence. I specifically made sure I remembered, but Katie didn't know because she didn't do the job either. And also, that's not my job. My job is to be the face. Uh, this is a democracy, and me and Katie have decided it's your job. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, and so I have actually read a Mark Lawrence book before. I think I read the first of his Prince of Nothing books, and this was very different from it. That book is very grim, dark, edgy, um, and so I was kind of interested to see how this one worked out. This is uh, a book that is much more standard fantasy than the romanticy and YA we've been reading. Um, and thank God, um, because while this book has issues, I it was so much more readable and enjoyable. And the romance in it was so much less odious because the author wasn't trying to be spicy with it. This is going to be an odd book to talk about because I think a bit like Mur The Murmuring Bones, this is a book I enjoyed and I liked, but like I have a lot of notes about it and complaints. I just it like it just has issues and stuff and like I think the book just would be so much stronger if it was 30% shorter cleaner yeah and it just there's too long I don't care about this stupid fire that's going on for half the book one of the very first things I noticed and I uh, complained about it to Maria while I was in traffic because I literally paused the audiobook called her and complained about it was that it's so repetitive especially in Ivar's chapters like in the first like half of the book it's like they'll tell you what happened just five seconds ago and then in the middle of the chapter then they'll say it uh, he'll say it again in the same um, like sort of worrying and it's like what i this isn't an anime i don't need a recount of what just <laughs> happened before and and it, it happened later i noticed it in, again in one of uh lavira's chapters these are our two main characters that are the pov characters but literally it was like uh she couldn't stop thinking about this thing for the past three days since she last saw ivar and then she talks about it and then like Five pages later, she's like, it had been three days and she couldn't stop thinking about this thing since she last saw Eva. And I'm like, you just said, like, and it's, it's weird because like Katie and I were like, was there no editor? But which is insane. It wouldn't be as good as it is without one. And if it was, then like, you know, God tier. I wonder how much of it is a genre convention where he's just like, oh, I have all this space. I'll fill it. Uh, whereas if he was in working like in YA, you'd be like, no, this can't be 28 hours long. I don't know if it's 28 hours. Long. I love how Evar's siblings were introduced as though they were MMO right. classes. I know. Before you jump in farther, though, Maria, what is the basic premise of this? Because people complain that we don't do the premise for and I understand, but we just get carried away. The premise of this book is um, a society that uh, centers around a library as a wealth of knowledge where uh, things go because the library has so much information. Societies develop very quickly. And around this library, there are, which is centered in this city, there is this dusty, like, deserted area that is populated by small groups of humans. Uh, their enemy is who they refer to also this is going to be a thing they're called sabas it's spelt saber a, a saber to be fair um the i think it's just the narrator because she also the narrator says eva 
instead of Ivar. And I don't know if it's supposed to be pronounced that way or if it's just her accent. So I think it just happens. Sometimes she pronounces it at Sapa, like a little bit. And yeah, I, she I does. couldn't figure out which one was quite which. But yeah, no, it, they're, we're going to call them Saba. The Saba and uh, they are a humanoid canine uh group of people where they have their legs are like uh dog legs but they stand upright Easy to grade. humanoid features but a, a little cross with canine feline marie and i had a very uh frustrating conversation yesterday how the descriptions of the wolf dog people are not consistent and i'm not really sure what to picture it's because half the time i'm like wait are they mostly human they just have fucked up legs with some like weird hair or are they covered in these fur? are degrade legs are actually far more efficient than human legs okay but go ahead they're not fucked up our legs are fucked up i'm just calling it the way it is from uh leviosa's perspective wingardium point is though is that i'm not entirely sure how wolf-like or how dog-like they're supposed to look continue maria with the premise in one of these uh communities out in the dust outside the city uh is our main character lavira her settlement is attacked by the sabas and which starts her quest into the city of craft into the library where she trains as a librarian but this library def uh defies time and uh and species lines it has books from everywhere and so uh it is her and then there's also a second main character who is trapped in the library somewhere with his siblings oh i thought you said who's trash which is true no. <laughs> who is trapped in the library somewhere with his five siblings in a specific room because the library has massive rooms and he uh had, God, how do you even explain the mechanism? He lost a huge chunk of his mirror. It's kind of Piranesi, but he has some people in there with him, and uh, he is on a quest to find the vague figment of a woman in his dreams uh, from his uh, memories that he can't actually remember, but he knows a woman was involved somehow. So he's going for, he's looking for that. Lavira is is trying to become heckin' good librarian and find out the secrets of the library, and their quest brings them closer together. And and how how do things play out? Promise. Hilarity ensues. Yes. Okay, <laughs> Hilarity. <good job. laughs> the most important question, is this monster boyfriend? No. 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 Absolutely not. Doesn't count. Absolutely nope. not. It would have nope. been monster boyfriend. I would have given it to them, except they denied the fundamental precept of monster boyfriend, which is you have to fall in love when he looks like the monster. You can't fall in mm -hmm. love when he looks like a normal human guy. Not Monster Boyfriend. Not Monster Boyfriend. That won't become a YouTube short. Very true. I, I had thought about that as well, and I was like, no, it's betraying. And then also, he's mostly just like a dog person, and like furries exist, so that doesn't count. No, but it could have been a really fun Monster Boyfriend. Um, it, Oh, God, imagine if he was actually the name of the thing that's only mentioned like two times, the insectoid people, and she fell in love with an insectoid. How, that would have been really startling. I do like upsetting. how the more evil one is the less human-looking one. I enjoyed this book a lot it, for how long it was it was weirdly enjoyable there were some points where i was like okay th this is a little long for me part of the problem is i enjoyed some of the slower parts uh like i enjoyed the first third uh and it's it's kind of pace a little bit and then the last third is way more sped up you go from spanning years and years and years and years uh to okay we're going to have like three days that take up a giant chunk of this book um and i also for me i thought ivar's uh plot in in the first half i found him very i don't want to say pointless but kind of pointless like it makes it makes sense like you need I, I i get why it's there but i also don't want it and i found it very boring and i found him kind of boring uh and it wasn't until he finally like met up with her that things got interesting and so i i wish that there was a way to have done that in a better way i like i wish she would have found there are ways but anyway i also did not love the romance um i didn't dislike it i didn't <laughs> I, I didn't think it was gross. It didn't make me, uh, like recoil um, in disgust. Recoil in disgust. It, and it's just for me, what it lacked was my emotional investment in it as a romance. Where like the book was like, ah, yes, this is the romance, but without insisting too hard upon it. It wasn't like the star cross lovers, the sex bodies. You know, it it wasn't doing that. But 
uh, for me, I just wasn't invested because they had spent so little actual time together. I got why Lavira was into him because young girls, and I think young people's ability to build people up in their minds as these big figures. Uh, but for me, that was never a challenge. Like, I got why she had fixated on him, but there was no challenge of what he was in her mind versus who he actually was, which would have been super interesting. Uh, and then I also just didn't fully understand why, like... He was in love with her after, like, like I just, and the whole book thing. I, just, I liked a lot of this. I liked the idea of the, cycl <laughs> the cyclical nature of, of war, of the repetitiveness, how we will make enemies of anyone. I, I liked a lot of that stuff. But there was a couple of things that I just, uh, best character, Valente. Oh my god, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I loved oh, it. Good doggo. Um, I will say that I thought that the two storylines were both okay, but they did not complement each other well. This either needs to be Piranesi, where it's just from the point of view of Evar, Eva, where then it's girl he keeps meeting as she gets older each time, a la um the consul's tale from hyperion mm. um and that is an interesting story man who's stuck in this very weird liminal place uh, the library is an ecosystem even though it's not enough of an ecosystem in its own right but whatever we'll talk about that later um that i really would have liked or i would have liked girl keeps going back to the library and meets somebody who's stuck there but the two together i found clashed like i kept being like can we get back to 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 lavera's part can we do we have to keep going back to this guy and yeah maria is totally right it does not make sense that in a day he would be like all over her and yes we'll talk later about why there are reasons for that but i just didn't i emotionally i didn't you buy as it. the reader like i didn't i didn't fall in love with them as a couple you know like there has to be that moment where you as the reader are like Oh my god, they're kind of cute together. But unfortunately, what this book does is it plays its hand. Ivar knows he was once in love with someone and is searching for the woman of his faded memories. And you know it's going to be Lavira. <laughs> so there's no point where you see the two of them interact and you're like, oh. I was really hoping it was going to actually put like that expectation this. and it was going to be something else. Here's one question and I'll ask you guys. Did you feel like Lavera's personality changed a, into a little bit more manic pixie girl as the book went on? Stop, stop. I have something to say about that, okay? That was going to be my whole shit because you guys already covered a lot of stuff just now, okay? Okay, go ahead. I was going to discuss how the pacing frustrated me, including the characterization of our main characters as time went on throughout the story. Uh, Ivar has no pl uh, plot, has no character development almost like whatsoever, and a majority of the problem is that he's like this safe man like type of thing or as you were saying like the straight man type of thing where he's supposed to be like a a, a do-gooder but it was kind of frustrating it's because through the lack of strife or tension in his personality and choices and stuff and even then he doesn't like it's not like he has to be considering oh am i gonna kill this person or not but he just didn't he was not given any situation that could define him in any meaningful way. And every time we got to his chapter, I was fine with it, but it was also simultaneously like, oh, so we're going to slow down massively. Yes, I know, Maria. <laughs> and we're going to slow down massively, and I'm not going to get almost anything out of this chapter. Not to mention that half the chapters themselves were, like, as I already said, kind of repeating what happened in the last chapter. Almost nothing really happens. Ivar needs his own actual, like, plot beyond just finding Lavira. Although, it could just be finding Lavira. That's fine. But there needs to be some hijinks that ensue in between rather than him just ghosting in and out of, like, the, the past or whatever. And just seeing some really depressing stuff that doesn't actually help contribute towards almost anything other than him seeing this one thing, but we'll get to that. And even then, it does almost nothing. In fact, I would argue it's completely pointless. Um, but Lavira herself, when she's younger, I really liked Lavira. Lavira is great. I was instantly hooked on her personality, loved her. Then she became an adult. And when she became an adult, all of a sudden she's starting hating on the Sabbaths and she's like, oh, 
they should die. Whereas when she was younger, there was not that much animosity between her and them. It was more like, wow, that really sucked. But I'm looking at it from this like very curious perspective. And I want to like, she wanted to learn their language. She wanted to know more about them. She was asking them, like she was engaged and she almost recognized as a child, a very wise like detail that it's just people against people. And yet that changes. Like, when she becomes an adult? Her hatred of the Saba feel very counter to the character that is established. Who she is. She is, to she is presented to us as someone who is a sponge, who remembers things uh, vividly, who, uh, even as a child, she realized that actually maybe they weren't going to eat the children. Like, when she asked, like, are you going to eat us? And the Saba went, are you good to eat? Is she, like, as a child. And so there's this really weird... Uh, thing where her her hatred of the Saba requires her to be dumber than she is yes. in a <laughs> fundamental way. And she got dumber over time. And for her to see the things she sees at a later point and not put the pieces together where you as the reader are like, they're fucking there. Because there are times where she put stuff together and I was like, oh, I mean, I see how that happened. I told Maria yesterday, I was like, when she and Ivar go into the past and see all the Saba and the humans lying around dead with each other. The very first thing that comes to me, the reader's mind is, oh, so they lived in har harmony at one point rather than being against each other. And the instant thing she's like, she's like, they're idiots. They killed themselves and trying to kill the others. That was so stupid. I get why Ivar wouldn't make that conclusion because Ivar is not as smart as her. But the fact that you have built this character to be as intelligent, as quick-witted and as sharp in a very specific way and then all of a sudden it's like we need all the weapons to kill the savants how could this possibly go wrong for us like like just it, it didn't it, make it, any sense miss ali snow says has a good one she says lavira's minimal personality changes seem dependent on the plot and that's something i saw a lot in the discord by the way we have a discord uh we'll shill for it in a moment um but that a lot of people were saying that like the characters really conform to the plot instead of the other way around. And that's something I really felt. It felt a lot like, well, the characters need to be doing this thing now and they need to be thinking this thing for the plot to make sense. But you're not like, okay, but the, they're not driving the plot, so to speak. Um, but when I say Discord, how would you get, even get into Discord? What Join is our Discord? Patreon. We have three tiers. We have uh, uh, our Patreon tier where you get to be in the Discord and talk to lots of people. There's also a lot of writers if you'd like to join. We have our book club members. We do uh, live streams twice a month, one of which they get to pick the books and vote on them and decide what we do, one of which we pick That's and then they one. get to read with us. Yeah, this is the one. Woohoo! End, end of month live stream. And then we have our Parasocial Darlings, which gets all the benefit of the previous tour. Plus, they get critique streams where Katie and uh, William look at books at a micro level level to see how the language is working join it's a good time also if you can't comment uh like engage with this video the dis the algorithm really likes it back to this because i, I want to make a point uh, <laughs> <laughs> so angry otter says well they did kill her aunt and try to enslave her and yes, yes but... and that's why it would make sense if young her hated them viciously but as she got older and she read more and she saw the cyclical nature like it makes no sense to me that you is literally like here are the pieces, Lavira. You are the smartest girl I know. Take, take the puzzle pieces. And she's like, no, fuck your puzzle pieces as an adult. Also, she didn't really like her aunt. I got That's the thing is that I never got the sense that she even liked the people she was from and, or felt connected to them. So there was no loss. She just joined the library and was like, dope. That is what happened, William. That is exactly what happened. And what it should have been, it's because I thought she was supposed to be like, not a sociopath, obviously, but she was like so intelligent and beyond her little m m microcosm of a community. She was dehydrated by the waste. She was just a survival yes. instinct. She was cunning. And then in dialogue, all of a sudden, she's like, I'm willful, guys. It's cool. I'm a magic pixie teen girl. Like, and it was such a weird, charring change to me, but that's not what we're talking about. We just talked about that. Go ahead. One thing I was going to say, though, real quick, is there's this one very specific part where you're talking about, Maria, right? Where she's being led away, roped up, a, a prisoner of the Saba, and she's thinking to herself, there's a lot of hurt and anger inside me, but I'm going to put it in a little box and I'm going to shove it all the way in the back. And I'm like, okay, that right there already shows how emotionally, like, in both intelligent and also not mature she is so that's great that's fine i'm cool with that because she's kind of a weirdo with how smart she is but then like 
when did she reopen the box? We never got that scene. There's no, there's the scene when she finally gets into the library and she's in her own room there and she cries. But that's it. Like, but it's not her but processing. It. It's just her crying. And again, I don't mind that she dislikes the Saba. What I mind is that as she gets older and despite yes. the fact that she is seeing things that nobody else around her is seeing, that she's literally being led by Ute. And this makes not, no sense for the people who are listening, but Ute is uh, one of the top port parts of the... Despite all of that, that she... Is, her And part of it was her, her hatred, while it could have been justified, didn't feel real emotionally. Clovis is. Uh, hatred feels real and defined and angry. Lavira's like comes in and out. It's not something that she lives with because I'm fine with if she had been described as a character where that hatred was a, always a huge part of her. Like if she, uh, like if we just felt it more, that was my thing is I don't feel like it, it was as vivid as it needed to be to justify her completely disregarding what you was telling her. I thought, oh, I almost felt like I missed something when she turned, I think it was like 18 or 20 or something like that. Like the scene, there's a scene where she's, uh, so the first half of the book is like very much, much slower in the way of the pacing, which I actually preferred that one, but whatever, that's neither here nor there. Um, but then it speeds up. It's because we need Lavira to get, you know, old enough to fuck. And, um, uh, <laughs> am I wrong? No. Um, yes. uh, no, but that's going to be the cold open. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's this one scene where she's in this, like, shopping plaza and her and her book friend that also, like, really wants to, you know, be with her. But she's like, nah, bro, I'm, like, too hot for this, like, dude in the middle of nowhere um, that I've seen, like, for five seconds. But anyway, the point is, though, is she's there and then there's an attack and she like freezes up and then like all of a sudden we start really hearing her spewing the whole like we need weapons to kill them stuff. And I'm like, wait a second, where was the scene where this incited? Like where, why, how did she change to be such a radical in this view? I mean, I could understand it being surrounded by her new friends who are human in a library in a city full of humans, full of like a whole bunch of all that bias, but it never is shown to us. Well, she could also do the whole insecure immigrant thing where they then become more um, fascist yeah. than the people that are there. A la Napoleon is not French, he's Corsican. Hitler is not actually German, he's more like Austrian and like that thing where as a minority you have to be outspoken. Uh, the Blair White syndrome, you have to become more outspoken because you want to be the one true whatever thing to fit in. Um, that could have happened, but the book spends so much time with nothing happening, and then there's like when it, there should be more interaction between like her and Eva, and like showing of that arc, there it just isn't there. Angry Otter makes a quick point. Um, there are people who get knowledge. Uh, there, there are, are people, people who, who get, get knowledge, knowledge, but not but people. Not oh, they get knowledge as in, but they don't understand people. People, yes. So I didn't mind her being a, a little dense, though it did drag on too long especially when they saw the city full of humans and dog people and she didn't get what was happening. And and that's the thing is, is it, it does, like like I said, I'm okay. And what Katie said is perfectly correct. If you had built up the hatred as, as her assimilating to the society and despite the fact that she kind of knows better, she has to ignore the voices yeah. in her head. Like, I'm okay with that. Uh, but it, it's not there. Real quick, I want to make a comment about Ivar. The big problem with Ivar, my boy, not my boy. That he's a wiener? No, he has no agency. His inciting incident to jump into the well to try find her isn't something he just decided to do. A book told him to do it. Ivar has no agency for the majority of the book. It is not until the end when he's like, must to save her, where you're like, okay, that kind of like, he's had a, 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 an idea of what he needs to do and now he's going to do it. But by making his entire purpose, Ivar is our second main character, as we mentioned, and his entire purpose is to find Lavira. He doesn't know it's Lavira, but that's his entire purpose. And unfortunately, what that does is it flattens him as a character. All of his agency is being pushed aside on this quest you rarely feel like there's no point where he's like no i want other things besides this but he yet he's forced down the path and even his decisions away from it forces him down this path which would have been fascinating could you have imagined the force of the library pushing these two or like the this thing and he like fighting against it and trying to work against it but like it just happening like that would have been a fantastic thing to engage with and would have given him some depth unfortunately he's got none he's he's uh, uh, even even when he goes and he sees the there's a huge part of the book where he, all of his chapters are him observing things happen to other people that's it 
He's not actually doing anything. He is becoming... Ivar is a lot of uh, the story trying to get information into the reader through Ivar observing and interacting with things. And not in a way where it feels like it's organic to the character. It feels like the character is a bit blank and thus we are watching him get filled. And it makes it for a very frustrating read because Lavira is not like that at all. Lavira is... Sometimes you're like, where did you get this idea, Lavira? Like, but it is <laughs> part of the problem is his whole plot line takes place in the span of like 24 hours to 48. So like, there's not really a chance for him to change much. Katie is having an aneurysm. Go ahead. I'm very politely waiting until she was finished with her point. Would I prefer that? Yes, that is my preference. However, I'm totally fine with his like main mo being uh that was repetitive. His mo being. Lavira and figuring out who she is and why he has this good first of all uh, Maria and I are on the same page probably will is too I'd imagine maybe maybe not that the whole uh, we'll get to it at some point but the reason he knows her is because he she like wrote something and he like lived it it doesn't matter we'll get there but the point is is like that's kind of a cop out in my opinion and I don't really like it it seems really watered down in a couple of ways that we'll get to once we get into more detail but that's neither here nor there um, but the point is, is like, I'm fine with him being like, oh, I live with this life with someone. It feels ghost like I don't know who that is. I want to find that person. But how does that person I would have preferred the more complicated nature of that. Like this person probably doesn't exist. It's because like, I mean, she's long dead um, or like she, so she existed before, which she probably didn't because I was a child, uh, because when he originally we'll get into it point is he was a child when before he goes into this like stasis thing and then he comes out and then he grows up in the library but the point is is like i'm fine with him wanting to find out who lavira is however like comboed with what william says we are given very little time with him and what time we are given he doesn't go on a journey of any real sort the only journey he goes through is he goes to the exchange which is this magical amazing place where things cr that are crazy can happen and nothing crazy happens he just jumps into these two portals to look at the past and he observes the past he's just looking at things but he is not fighting anything he's not doing anything it has been made i almost felt like it the author meant to do it and then forgot to do it is that um it's constantly said he's not as good as his siblings clovis his one uh, female sibling is like really good at fighting um uh uh what's the s name i don't remember the, the other two there's a psychology one and there's Stavril. a spy one stable stable is a great assassin or whatever um then there's carol and he's like a psychologist basically and then there was another dude who knew a lot about history that just like went missing but the point is is he very often mentions that he has learned so much and then in these little bubbles of moments throughout later on when he interacts with others he's like oh wow even though compared to the masters my siblings i'm still pretty good because i've learned so much from them and instead of that being the journey that he discovers i felt like that was supposed to be his journey learning that even though he came out of this mechanism thing that we'll talk about and he didn't have any super cool mmo skills um he still was able to learn from them and be empathetic and we don't get any scenes where he has to to use that empathy to solve a problem except for later on in the main storyline but not through his own character arc we don't really get i mean baby bits but nothing that really matters and then we don't get any like oh he has to assassinate someone and he's really good at it or he has to we get like a few little fight scenes we don't get any like oh he understands the inner mind of people like his sibling carol and then he slowly but surely follows the little past ones to realizing oh he's his own individual person and then like he doesn't have like a force working against him like lavira does so it's very very boring on his side of things and so it does really feel like his perspective was purely given because lavira needed a boyfriend it's really bizarre because there's a point where he says he feels like his siblings are complete people because they have a, a thing that defines them which is and there's no point where he realizes oh that's dumb they are not complete people they are not whole they they have never interacted with anyone and by my interaction with lavira and meeting other people and expanding who i know that is what is making me more whole because i don't like the idea i i just hate this as a convention I and know. this is this is purely a me thing i hate this this person is my purpose and my completion i don't like it it is so it 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 
plays into everything we're told about love and romance. Depends how it's portrayed. The thing is that me and Katie are shipper trash, and so we fundamentally like it, but we're also both smart enough to go, oh, it's not great for a character motivation. I'm fine with a character whose other purpose is another character, but there it, 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 if it is that, there needs to be, it's like eating, okay, it's like eating a steak that has not been seasoned oh, whatsoever. Oh God, are there's we doing like, food metaphors again? <laughs> let me finish. There's no salt, there's no A1 steak sauce, there's nothing, there's nothing on it. So if you're gonna serve, yeah, no. So if you're gonna serve that to someone, it better be, oh, when you taste it, all the different little levels of fatty morsel, like it better be cooked goddamn well if it's gonna be unseasoned and give it to me. So that's what I'm saying. So again, please note that some of my comments here are going to be from a per personal preference where this just is not a trope I like. Um, and I, I, it for me, it just feeds into a lot of things. Angry Otter made a point that I love. This is exactly what I want out of this. I would have enjoyed them being besties instead of lovers. Maybe they become lovers in the next book. I liked Ivar, but his point of view needed a lot of tweaking to match Lavira's energy. The thing is, by setting it up as a lover's thing, it flattens it so much. I like the idea of him being in search of an, of another person. Someone who, like, I don't like the idea of feeling like it's romantic. Because the, uh, the idea of getting out of the space, I mean, he's trapped with his siblings in a giant library room. Two miles in any direction. Like, that's as much as you got, you know? Um, and, and two, like, I'm going to call them robot people. We'll explain what they are. The idea of just being on a quest to find someone else and him knowing that he should be able to find this other person just as a, I, I, I want to know more than I know now for me would have made so much more sense. And I also like the idea of them, you know, being friends first and, and not going directly in, into lovers. Cause that is just, I, I hate that. It's like, I hate it. it he exists for Lavira. It's just so he's not a person in his own right. That's the problem. Here's the thing. When you are in love, you are writing a dopamine high. You are basically drugged into liking the other person sexually or emotionally to an extent, right? And like, th that's not to be cynical about it. That's just how it is. This is why like attraction starts to die out after a certain period because your brain literally stops feeding you the correct chemicals. And obviously there's a deeper, deeper forms of love or whatever, but I'm just talking about for initially. And the thing about it is because of that, romance can cheapen a relationship. Not to be one of those people who's always like, but in my book all the time. But I remember in one story I was writing, I was planning a romance between these two characters and I kept pushing it farther and farther until it actually wasn't even in the book because it cheapened the connection that they had as people and their relationship and dynamic. And the thing about it is that all that Maria was saying about Lavera being another person and that fundamentally being special in his world gets kind of undone if it's just hormones and it's just like this burning passion or love or whatever. And again, this book is much better about it than a lot of the other books we've read. Again, we're ragging a lot on this book, but it does it so much. I prefer this so romance so much more to everything else. And the other thing is that, and I've talked about this all the time, foreplay is important. Women don't understand this, but it is. And the thing is that you always want to be slightly trailing your reader and how much they want the two of them to get together. You don't ever really want to get them together more than the readers do, because then the reader starts going like, like, again, it's that whole flirting thing. Like you don't want to give too much too early. And then the author's hand shows and it feels like it's insisting on a thing instead of rewarding you for a thing. Um, and this book overtakes that very quickly like initially i thought it was like a little bit sweet and then by like halfway through the book i was like oh my god you guys need to chill out laura says yeah say and this is about ebar uh laura b says yeah same i really liked him but i wish he'd spent his time doing other stuff and not just reciting all the stuff about his siblings over and over also i'm not quite sure he forgets her after being in the mechanism oh my gosh yes would have been uh, would have been interesting for him to remember something but not enough and then have to reconcile that with her changing slash aging persona when they finally meet okay that was gonna god damn you laura that was gonna be my crowning jewel comment at the very end of everything it's because that's something I, it, that occurred to me this morning i remember what i was gonna say yeah despite the fact that for o almost an hour we have been ragging on this book i have to say I highly recommend anyone who likes fantasy like this. It's because, or I highly recommend this book to anyone who likes fantasy like this. It's because it is 
incredibly well written. I just really wish we were basically given the same pacing as what we got at the beginning, but throughout this book, and Lavira never got older than like 15. How could they have sex later if she's 15? Katie, think ahead. That's what I'm saying. Friends to lovers type or enemies to friends to lovers, whatever. Like this could have been a true that. And I don't, God, there's just so much. There's so much. I just feel like, like you said, 30% of fat. This, this is just a hunk of really delicious prime cut no, meat. No, no, no. But it no, needs to be no. cut. One of the things I will say is descriptions in this book, and this is a general comment, and then we'll go into the plot. Descriptions in this book can sometimes be a little bit hard to follow. I thought at first that this was an active thing the author was doing because there are there are specific things that Ivar and Lavira see differently. And so I thought the fast and loose nature of the descriptions was playing into that. But there are some times where either the description's hard to follow and you're like, what the fuck did I just listen to? And like the to, Sabbaths. Like, and then other times where I'm like, did you, do you remember how you first described them? Are you describing it the same way? And I think part of that is what causes my giant plot hole, but also it is just a giant plot hole, but we'll get to it. Let's do the plot, shall we? Uh, as I said in my uh, little s premise of the book, uh, our story starts in the dust, in the desert, the dust outside uh, the city in what was a, what used to be a lake it is in the bed of a lake uh and lavira is a heckin smart uh heckin uh like uh her perception's very high she, she's definitely got main character syndrome she she doesn't back down from stuff if she feels like she's being slighted she's gonna but i like it i do there's there's a a capricious a capriciousness to her that is very endearing precocious. when she's precocious there we go that was the P word I was looking for. She's very precocious. What's nice is instead of her getting like petty in certain moments or like, uh, or not petty, um, she is doing things that I wish characters would do in certain moments if they were intelligent enough to do it. And she's supposed to be intelligent enough to do it. So it's fun. And it, I, he just, he really, uh, it, it comes off naturally at the beginning, in my opinion. Yeah, very much main character syndrome, but it's like, oh, but this is fun. I like having a kid. Like, cause all the other stuff going on around her is, really awful so it's kind of nice to have a little bit of agency otherwise it would be just depressing yeah and she is a, an active character which is nice uh, she does a lot of things that shape her narrative um and like that's nice it, it some people found her kind of mary sue-ish i think but i never quite... yeah it didn't really hit there for me it got close but it didn't hit yeah it didn't really annoy me the only thing that really annoyed me about her was her like magic pixie dream girl stuff later in the book she gets into a fist fight with one kid because she found a scrap of paper she doesn't know how to read nobody in the settlement really knows how to read but she finds a scrap of paper with writing on it printed writing and she's like wow this is so hecking cool um and some boy tried to take it from her they get into a fist fight and uh and then she's like talking her parents are dead they died uh when she was younger she is living with her aunt um there is a well that slowly is losing its water level and they keep having to extend the length of the bucket and you very much get the idea of a kind of roughness to this life um but we don't spend a lot of time here because very quickly the savas attack one day coming through the dust is a group of people and at first they think they're humans because per the first part of the book uh the they're they look mainly humanoid until you notice their legs and, and then they also they have a fine sprinkling of hairs on them aka fur why can't you just call it fur um but unless it's not supposed to be fur and it is supposed to just be really fine, numerous hairs, in which case I don't know what I'm picturing. Really the biggest problem was is that later on in the book, and I don't mean to interrupt you, Maria, but this is a point I wanted to make and you're talking about the physical characteristics of them. Um, later on in the book, it's described that Ivar's language as a, Saba, not Saba, we'll get to, um, is that, uh, is like growling and stuff. And then the human language, when he tries to speak it, is like kind of hard to like, use with his mouth and so i'm like does he have a muzzle i don't understand is he is he is he more dog than person or is he more person than dog and i don't i don't know i just don't know i think some of it is kept overly vague because he wants to be able to have the twist later um, and I think that kind of makes the descriptions a little bit weird sometimes because he's trying yeah. to hide that twist. I guess, but it just doesn't work for me. I was very, con I didn't know what to picture in my brain. Yeah, and so Science Fantastic says, I guess they're just furry men with 
how you ever you say that digital grade i have to talk about that a lot as a warhammer fan sabba's attack uh her they take a bunch of the children and they're like you're mine now we're taking you and they they tie them up and they got them like on a string of rope um the one of the uh like the one kid's got a cough it's they've got some young kids and lavira being lavira who we've established is heckin spunky and precocious literally goes are you going to eat us uh to and and the Saba goes in her language are you good to eat and and it is described as a sarcastic comment i love i love that mo i love how much lavira is emotionally intelligent in this moment or like just perceptive it's because she's like he said it in the way that most people would say it if it were sarcastic, not as in a matter of fact, true question, but she wasn't sure because she wasn't used to their mannerisms. And I was just like, one thing this book does that's actually, and we get this comment a lot is like, oh, you're not supposed, like we get this about Iron Widow a lot and other ones like, oh, you're supposed to understand that the character isn't seeing things objectively. And like, how would the author tell you that they're doing bad things if it's in their viewpoint? There's also some discussion about this, about the King Killer Chronicles, where people um, were like, oh, but you know, it's all from his viewpoint and like that kind of stuff. And the thing is, this book is very good at and shows how you can show things to the reader that the character does not necessarily agree with or think about so throughout the whole book there's all this stuff everyone everyone is constantly talking about how terrible the saba are but you can tell up until the twist even that like oh no they're actually another intelligent species and like there's just a lot of racism going on or racism as uh is trademarked for this podcast um and so it's done through like this little comment that's like very clearly like oh he has a sense of humor and he's smart there's also certain expectations we understand the writer isn't gonna make them <laughs> like a dog person um and it, it's interesting because that can be something of a one thing that sometimes happens in the trump era is that i've noticed is that people can limit other people's evilness by their lack of imagination and so often we'll be like oh no nobody could be that bad so like in iron um flame and in fourth wing we kept talking about how the author must know that the war college is really bad and like is eugenics -y and bad but like that is actually never borne out by the text in this case it is borne out by the text we give them the benefit of the doubt that like racism is bad and then it's proven true later but we don't have to wait two books for it this is such a great well i'm so glad you brought this up because it really is a fin fantastic example that you can have the character thinking a thing but you through telling the book even from the character's point of view show the reader that the character is wrong like it is entirely possible you don't have to have the character believing everything <laughs> that the uh, character that the like you don't have to be right there with them uh, to be like oh well that's accurate to their point of view no you can you can trust your reader to paint a landscape where the reader can go oh no this is fucking and that's where people made. get angry so let's talk like real techniques because i was paying attention because you know we got to be specific on this podcast we don't just survive off of vibes like other ones <clears throat> i was watching a lot of booktubers and they annoy me um okay so like that sarcastic comment that's a good way of being like oh the character is taking it the character inwardly kind of thinks a thing um but outwardly is like no that's not the thing that's one way of doing it later uh you who is a character that we respect and is view and is uh kind of uh deputized by the narrative as the moral and smart person he's like i don't think they're that bad so that's another way you can do that um another book that actually did that was the poppy war towards the end there's a character who has been shown as good who's like you kind of committed a war crime what's up with that he, and even though the main character is like no i didn't it clues you in as the reader um again there's the fact that we know racism is bad so we just assume that this trope is going to be subverted later and and it is other books it's not but that kind of gives you some time in there um and i think in general it's also for example shown that everybody's really racist towards the um the dust people the dust people so you get the sense that like oh this is a culture where there's a lot of racism the dog fuckers is what they call them. Yeah, and so those are all ways that the author can be like, this is what's going on, guys. Not like, yeah, and to distance the narrative and talk to the reader without the character fully 
espousing of you, I guess. Angry Otter brings up the point, which is, uh, I think you can run into the issue where it's so obvious to the reader that the character's assumption is wrong that you get annoyed with them for not getting it. I do think we hit that point a little bit with Lavira mm -hmm. uh, yes. in this book. We were yes. talking about, but I think there are points at which you can do it really well. Yeah. And for the most part, outside of when it just, and honestly, in those parts, it feels just like he made Lavira dumb all of a sudden. Yes. Um, <laughs> but I, I think for the most part, you can you can do this thing. You can show that this is a bad thing, even if your main character is a bad character. Because one of the complaints we had in Iron Widow was that the character is doing some problematic stuff, but the narrative is never like, this is problematic. Um, and people who defended it were like, well, it's from her point of view. She doesn't think she's doing anything wrong. And like, you can do both. <laughs> it is entirely possible for a narrative. Now, the Here question go, becomes then, are you a skilled enough writer to be able to do that? If you're not, fair enough. And if you tried, good job. But it's not a successful... Uh, I don't it, think it's hard. I think it's I very think... hard. Well, you have to remember, a lot of these people that are publishing, such as uh, Fourth Wing and stuff, like... How many things have they written and gotten peer reviewed? Like if they have gotten a shit ton of peer review and they're and they've been given critique and they've been like, oh, okay, I realize I've been doing these things wrong. Let's build on it. That's one thing. And if you're still repeating that same issue, then obviously there's issues. Uh, you'd be fired if it were job. If it if it were your job. I think first of all, Fourth Wing is a weird example because that lady has written a ton of books. Um, but I think in the examples I'm thinking of, I think it's a genuinely held view of the author. Fourth Wing, I really don't think the author understands how problematic the whole uh, Full Metal Jacket training camp is. In Iron Widow, I don't think the author fully understands how many war crimes her character is committing or that it's not okay. But that's the other side of the coin. You know, like that's not just then, oh, you're a struggling writer. That just is, you're a struggling human being. Right, but I don't think it's that hard to write necessarily. I think in the cases oh, that we're oh, looking at. I see what you're saying. But yeah, that was just something I wanted to talk about because we do get a lot of comments about that. So. They're, they're in their trail, like they've got the rope trail leading the kids away somewhere, and um, then in uh, they, they hear a thwack and an arrow comes, kills one of the kids, and then suddenly there's a battle between the Sabas and some human people who are like, we're here to kill Sabas, but they also like don't really care about the kids, like after they've killed, the after the Sabas have run off and one of them was killed, they like un tie the kids and they're like follow and and, and there's a, a decision made uh that uh the injured uh soldiers will take the kids back to the city and the ones who are hailer are gonna go on and one of them is this guy who has this giant cut down his face from where one of the sappas got him and it's it's an open wound <laughs> at this point um they're in the desert a long time. The fact that that didn't get infected is wild to me. But anyway, and this guy, everybody is really, like, respecting. And our our little uh, spunky, inquisitive uh, Lavira can't stop asking questions. And she's like, where are we going? Why do you have a cut on your face? Why was everybody congratulating you? What are you doing? And then he was like, shut the fuck up. I love this entire... He's my, uh, uh, before you said uh, Valente, because uh, he is best boy, but uh, prior to that, I was going to say Mala was like literally the best character. He's Mala. a very kind of stock character of like the hardened veteran who has like a heart of gold, but it's tough. Um, but yeah, it's a strong one. He's still a fun character. He's so funny. But anyway, um, and uh, eventually the as they continue to travel and there's less water and less food, uh, she starts to get some questions out of, like answers out of these guys. And basically Malar is, uh, was congratulated because he killed a Saba. And apparently he's just really good at killing things. And then she's like, well, if you're so good and you're the only one who has done it, why aren't you in charge? And he's like, yeah, that's not how that shit works. Um... And so they take them into the city, and basically he's like, we're going to take you to get allocated? Yeah. Is that what it was? Yeah. For allocation. And I want everyone to know, during this sequence of events when they're walking through the city, none of the kids have been in a city before. They're being, like, spat at by super racist people, and they're being, like, pushed around, and they're starving and thirsty, and some of them can barely walk. And then, to top it all off at one point, because Lavere's asking too many questions, Mala shoves her into a horse trough. So it's really because you get the idea that the people that come from the dust, the dusters, are these lesser group of people to the city people. Um, and they have some, uh, like, physical features that are a little bit different, just kind of like as if it's uh, like a different, uh, like, region 
you know, um, and they're getting a lot of flack and they're also like the kids are literally coated in dust. They ain't never taken a bath in their life. And at first you think when Malar shoves her into the horse trough that he's being a dick because she asked a question. Yeah. Um, and I mean, uh, he is still being a dick. But... <laughs> yes, he's like, we're going to take you to allocation. And he leads up the majority of the kids and he tells her to hide behind him as they're going up these steps. And it's basically like a a, a building with like these big steps with multiple doors and he leads up the majority of the kids to the first door and he says he he tells Lavira to stand behind him and not to fucking move and just stand there and she starts trying to ask questions and he's like shut the fuck up and he hits her um in this moment he like slaps her like backhands her across the face to get her to be quiet they're going up a door because your kind only gets to be sewer cleaners and servants and uh, like the worst jobs, and you are smart enough that you can go into a different one. So shut the like at fuck least up. door number three. Uh, we can yes. at least try to get you into door number three. And that's also because she had saved his life in the desert against like a squid. Uh, they, <laughs> yeah, they call them sand. A bears. desert bear. Oh yeah, sand bear. Yeah, I was not expecting a tentacle monster when they called it a sand bear, but I guess that makes sense. It's the monster from Tremors. If anybody has watched that incredibly, old yes. Movie. She basically jumps in its mouth and like cuts it up with things on the inside to save Malar's She's life. She's pretty bad in that moment i thought actually at that point that she was going to be a warrior at some point and that's what was going to happen i legitimately thought he was going to take her and be like you've got this stuff kid let's, yeah let's go. No, <laughs> I, i'm actually a little disappointed that didn't happen it would have been a completely different book anyway so he's like so i'm, I'm gonna take you to door three so you can maybe be like uh that you can get a, a job in, in a nice house kind of thing and he puts one of his spare robes around her and he wears a black robe um, so that her yucky duster clothing can't be seen underneath it. And she's like, okay. So she starts walking up the stairs and she sees this one girl who's like dressed nicely and looks beautiful. And she kind of thinks of as a as a princess. My favorite character. Yeah, duh. Um, and, and the girl's like sneering at her and she's like, bitch you're gonna sneer at me i'm gonna walk into your door <laughs> i love that so shit i love it to the third door she's like no fuck you i'm gonna come to your door so she comes up to the the first door which is not the door she was supposed to be going into and there's like a guy in a white robe being like uh ah, make your argument for why i should let you in here because he, he immediately is like you don't look like this is your door and so <laughs> she has a um Perfect memory. I did. Oh, what I is it called? I did it. Yeah. yeah. And so she uh, speaks back what the Saba said when it first came to her village, which was basically, and she doesn't know what she's saying at this point, but it's basically. She was trying uh, to be tough. She just said something. She wanted to shock, you know, she, yeah. and the, the shockiest thing she had was what she heard the Saba say. And she says in Sabatine, which is the Saba language, um, I, I, you are mine. Do not fight uh for i will beat you kind of no thing. It, it was it was kind of like everything that is here is now mine mm. is what it was something to that effect but specifically at the end it was something about her like if, if you fight you shall be like I, yes like i will fight you um and so the guy's like Fam fucking and so they they let him in or they let her in and also so i should also say that the guy know the white coat lets her in specifically because a guy in a dark gray coat who is white af like white hair white eyelashes red eyes so uh albinism is like no let her in and and they're like, okay master you well we'll do that uh and she goes in and there's a couple of tables set up and you're supposed to go to each table and talk to the people uh, and at the first table lavira is about to show a mathematical sense that we will never see get used ever again. <laughs> I know. I was so angry. Oh god, I uh, guys, everyone watching, I want you all to know anytime there is a scene where there's a character who's really smart in a weird way that's like not typical, shows off how smart and amazing they are, I get hot and bothered. And when that's not used again, I get hot and bothered but in a different way, and that happened here. Also, can I just say I wanted to punch every single person's mouth? in this scene god i hate it when this shit happens where they're like oh she just is like uh, you what did they not check anyway continue i'm sorry but the thing about it is that it's interesting because this scene made me root for her instead of annoying me at the author and that's a problem that very commonly comes up on this channel and that's kind of what i mean by when i talk about how this book is actually 
very decently written in that there's mm -hmm. a lot of stuff that does work about the novel in a way that it doesn't in other ones like it kind of makes sense like okay she has this memory and she has this mathematical ability or whatever okay they're gonna you know th th there's a reason for why they're kind of um playing along with this at least for a little bit ah uh, there it is laura said it by the way what she says in sabatine is all of this is mine now and i will accept your surrender when she goes in the thing you realize is that while she has a really great great understanding of math on a conceptual level innately she does not know the terms so they ask her to multiply two numbers and she's like i have no idea what that means and she she like she doesn't and so she asks what does that mean and they're kind of intrigued by her question um and eventually the guy realizes that she doesn't know what the word multiplication means or divide so he asks the question again but in a different way that would make sense to her you're making him sound very nice what happened was she doesn't know what multiplication is they're like oh she obviously doesn't belong here then one of the kids on the side is like oh they count in beans you have to tell them to count in beans and so the guy being further racist is like okay say you have so many beans in this and then that's how she figures it out no because when he realizes so he does use beans as an example and it is kind of but he also realizes that i need to say this in a way because it should have been like what is five beans divided by this many beans like that wouldn't have helped her he would have still been using the language she doesn't understand so he does specifically say it does come up though no what he says is you have a hundred and like fifty thousand beans yes. and you have eight people it needs to get split between how many beans do each of them get so he isn't saying divide he, he realizes she doesn't know what that means and he puts it into a conceptual way she understands so while he is using beans like he, she, he does change the language to allow for her what i'm trying to say is that everyone's being a dick to her and still nonetheless she shows up so she knows the math he asks another question she's able to do that so she gets to move from the math table to the next table and at the next table she has to read a book uh she can't they then ask her because like they the, the lady kind of realizes ah you're smart enough where if you can write you can probably like be a house reader or something like that um and asks her to write her name and she can't like she's never held a quill before and so what she does is she just starts writing the figures that she memorized off of the scrap of paper that she pulled and they were like this is a oh like what how do you even know this text she's obviously mimicking something and you comes up and is basically like yo this girl is an uncut gem she obviously has never written you can see that her print gets better the more she does it she's obviously got a great memory that she's been able to memorize the scrap of paper and and do this her math skills are great and uh they end up asking uh the girl who was a bitch to her uh, outside to do the same math problem she did and she doesn't remember the answer and she can't do it as quickly as Livia did she could do it you know probably if she worked it out but Livia just did it in her head um and i uh, the they're talking and this one guy comes his name is lord algar and he's a real dick and he was like get this girl out of her to a door where she belongs and she doesn't belong in this and Ute's like you know she has a lot of things that could potentially be good for a diplomat and he was like how dare you disgrace the the <laughs> diplomat <laughs> and so um Ute's like so Livia gets kicked out and she's really angry. Uh Millar's not there anymore and you comes after her and he's kind of slow and he's like yeah Wait up. Um, and she's like, she's mad at him because she feels like she's been made fun of. And, and like he was because uh, somebody said as she's leaving, ah, Ute's experiments are sometimes not uh, the greatest. And she was like, I don't want to be an experiment for no one. Fuck you. And he was like, nah, follow me. I, I don't worry. I got you. And he takes her to her house. She meets this nice lady named Salamunda who makes her really yummy food. They have a cat named Wentworth. Salamunda is Ute's cook. Utes, she thinks Ute's house is the library. Oh, which is so cute, isn't it? But no, wait, Chantel made a really good point. I just want to point out before we move on in the plot. In those moments where she stood up for herself, I like how the author included a few brief moments where her confidence wavers. It felt more realistic. Uh, like her cleverness isn't bulletproof. Little things and little asides and little emotional reactions like that can add a lot. It's something I noticed uh, when me and Maria were reading The Keys to the Kingdom, which has a very... Um, a distant narrative feel to it um, and to the characters but one of the things that makes the characters feel real is they do have like these little realistic thoughts like oh this would or their confidence wavers in that way and that is a step ahead of a lot of the books we've read where the characters are just very flat and don't have those like like little ripples or eddies in the water so to speak uh yeah with food i don't even know how katie would explain this maybe the syrup is okay 
Continuing. Um, anyway, so you basically takes her to the library and is like, congratulations, you're now a trainee in the library. Maybe you'll be a librarian one day or a house reader or whatever the case is. And you is apparently famous for doing this. He's one of the deputy librarians. So he's in the, there's like the head librarian and then underneath is the four deputy librarians. And he basically just apparently brings in people who aren't placed here by the allocation people, but he just gets to bring wh whoever he decides should be in this program. He just gets to bring them to the library. Once you realize his real position there and everything, it makes a lot of sense. And the head instructor is like, because Olivia immediately starts asking questions and he's like, oh God, you Utlings, you always ask <laughs> all the questions. And obviously you get the idea that you is cultivating uh, minds that he sees other other people are not taking seriously because of whatever background they're coming from and and so you get the idea that you is not prejudiced he like he is immediately and this is a point that will was making earlier he's immediately set up as a character who is a good moral authority um and so when he says something is maybe not great you're like ah oh, even though our main character thinks it is it probably isn't which is you know one of one, uh, Good move. Basically, what's going to happen for our girl, Lavira for the next little bit is she's going to learn how to become a librarian. She's going to learn how to read and she's going to make friends. Cut. Uh, meanwhile, stuck somewhere in the library, hidden in doors that cannot be open, uh, we have uh, Ivar, who is um, a guy trapped in a library. He's like 20 something. Um, and he's like, yo, life sucks. I only have my siblings who aren't actually my siblings. Let me tell you that that when they first were like him and Clovis slept together. Good thing they're not actually <laughs> sisters. I was like, Jesus, what are what are you talking about? And basically, what you learn is that in the middle of this chamber that they live in is a mechanism and the mechanism is basically a kind of room that you can go into and it will bring the book you bring in with you to life around it and the aka the hollow deck as one of uh, our lovely patrons mentioned his siblings who he's not actually related to are five children who have all been trapped in the mechanism for a period of time and basically what happened is anyone could go their people have been trapped in this chamber of the library for centuries and Every once in a while, someone would go into the chamber, a child would go into the, the mechanism and just never come out. Like, suddenly the door's open, there's no kid in there, other people can go in, but people liked using the mechanism so much, it was, I mean, they're stuck in a giant library chamber, there's not much to do, I imagine the mechanism- Well, not just that, but also, like, I mean, yeah, actually, that's a good enough point in and of itself, but also everything that you go through in the mechanism, you learn inherently, so it's like- I mean, how stellar no, is no, that? No, 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 no. Not normally. That's only happened to them because they were in there for, like, a, a very long time. That's not what happens to other people. That's right. I forgot about that. Five kids got, over a period of time, got trapped in the, the mechanism. The first one, uh, I think, was Carl? Carol? Whose I, name no, was wasn't it Carl? Ivar? Wasn't it Ivar? Yeah, maybe Ivar. Ivar was first. Ivar's the oldest out of all of them. I honestly kept getting them all confused except for Clovis. Oh, no. I didn't have a problem with him because I hated all of them. And basically, each of these kids went in with a different book, but nobody knows. Even though we know what the other people's books are, nobody knows what Ivar's book was. And also, they don't know how long they were in there, but they all came out the same age that they were when they went in. Um, and so they're, they do understand, though, based on the fact that... Uh, Clovis was um, her pe the people that she was part of were decimated when she went in and had talked about the other children who went missing that this was like when Ivar first went in that was potentially like 150 years ago so it's been at different periods um, and so when they all came out all of the kids had an deep complete understanding of the books they went in with Clovis went in with a book about war and fighting and uh, warfare and so she is an excellent fighter and a tactician and like she just she just is ready for a war she also was put in very violently like she didn't go in of her own uh, accord she was thrown into the mechanism when the Saba attacked and her people were killed and her mother threw her in to save her life and ended her up throwing her in there with a book about warfare that her mother did not realize was about warfare and it turned her into a little like uh, she not only wants revenge for the death of her people, but she has the knowledge to enact it, which is a powerful combo. Then uh, his brother Starvel went in with a book about assassination and uh, espionage and killing people. And so Starvel is 
excellent, most excellent killer who has never killed anyone. Um, ninja. Ninja, basically, and uh, is of the group the best developed of of the group of uh, siblings. He he has some some depth to him. Then we have uh, Carol, who is the tallest uh, of them, and he went in with a psychology book, so he is <laughs> always just manipulating his siblings he, he immediately like if they're upset if they're sad he can he can look at them and then deduce what has happened like his psychology uh on on like level 500 <laughs> you know yeah it's also not how actual psychology works which is the funny part like it's not like if he went in with sigmund freud he would understand that much um and the thing about it is there's an interesting idea that because evar didn't go in with um, a book he just kind of doesn't even really remember what happened in his life and so he's the second best to all of them at the thing and there's this interesting idea of them kind of locked in this abusive family situation where they love and hate each other but I actually never really felt it like I felt like the author kept telling us that but there's not enough interactions where like they're actually friendly and they like each other and then all of a sudden they don't and you get a sense for being stuck with someone. Um, and that's kind of one of the things that I, I think the book does a lot. The book will bring up a really interesting idea and it'll talk about it a little bit, but you won't necessarily feel it. And like, that's going to come up when we talk about the themes. Like with Lavira later on, it seemed like the author really hit the nail on the head when it came to that portrayal and everything at the beginning. But the more it seemed like he tried to shove into this book, quicker to get to that whole oh Ivar and Lavira mwah, mwah. um <laughs> the 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 more the the sooner we got to that part the more it felt like it was losing its step and I'll say honestly this whole Eva part I don't think it needs to exist I think it should just be cut entirely I think all of the information in it could just be told through dialogue to Lavira while they're bonding like I I just don't feel like actually seeing these characters on the page was actually interesting enough to warrant the amount of pages it but takes. but see what i'm thinking is is that based off of what it seems like the author wanted to do i think ivar needs to be included but if then that's the case then less lavira more ivar and then and ivar a, and better plot for yes ivar? a plot? yeah a plot in general for ivar like it just it really feels like oh god it kind of feels like this per like the, the author wrote everything from lavira's perspective to begin with and then was like, ah, but like, I want this other thing to happen. And then like, or like wanted romance in it or something. I don't know. It was, kind of, it, it really felt weird. I will argue the will point, which is, I think he could have done it just from Lavira's point of view. I don't think Ivar's point of view is necessary until, until the last third of the book. So what you're saying is the content of his material towards the beginning is pointless, which yes, I agree with, which is why there should be plot, a whole, like, like a whole brand new thing input into it. I think it would be more interesting just from her point of view. I, I don't know why authors do this. I've noticed it a lot. Authors really like to include points of view from characters that don't need to be there. Like the current thing is that there, there is, you know, we are all alone in the world. And so we only ever see things from our point of view. And there's a subjectivity and a certain amount of atmosphere that comes from that, that gets punctured when you're then in somebody else's head seeing how they interact with it and it's just much more interesting to be like oh there are things I, uh, Lavera isn't really understanding and there's all this stuff going on and I think it would have helped with the mismatched tone of like she's in a real city and he's like doing his Piranesi thing but not as good yeah no I um uh I usually, I think you both know, I usually dislike books that switch perspective. Every single book that we have read so far where there's been a switch in perspective, whether it's good or bad, I've disliked because of the switch in perspective. I don't like multiple perspectives. That being said, uh, it still can be really like done really well. And it's just not, again, all the Lavira material up until she becomes, you know, uh, of proper age, um, doesn't, it, it's all really good and fun and interesting. And I wanted more of the politics of the city at that point because it felt like there was a lot invested mm -hmm. into that idea. And then we're just not given it. And it just, it really feels rushed. And don't even, I mean, we're not there yet. I have so much dislike for the ending of this book. <laughs> it's like, a mess. And I, uh, I literally just stopped paying attention at a certain point too because I just 
it was just like, I, there's a fire. We get it. Okay, there's some time stuff. I knew it was going to be the two of them the whole time. Like, whatever. Like, Ivar, uh, his big thing is he, he has been, he's the only one that has been really, really, they've all kind of looked for a way out, but he is doggedly because. <laughs> That's all. We see what you did there. <laughs> it was that not wasn't going to get past us. He's like, you know, I don't know what my purpose was. I don't know what my my thing was that I learned that I'm the best at. And he's like, but it's a person, and it's a. I think it's a a woman. Um, and he's like, he's like, I need to find this person that is my missing purpose. This is this is my purpose, and I need to get out of this library to find them. Ah, and so he's like trying to going through the stacks, trying to do the stuff. He's there are doors but the doors won't open and he can't figure out how to open them. And then one day he uh, is doing stuff and there are these things called escapes that come out of the mechanism and they're these like black monster I things. still don't understand what they are. They're the blood of the library working for Jaspeth. Like, Katie, how do you not understand? <laughs> like, it's very clear. I still don't understand. I still yeah. don't understand. That part was a little... But anyway, we'll get there. Um, So uh, he... He's trying to do his stuff. Uh, there's some escapes happening. There's a lot of escapes at once. And um, it he ends up having, like, a frustrated moment after the escapes attack. And he ends up, like, hitting a stack of books and it falls over. Um, and then a book kind of in the aftermath of the falling stack. And it was a really big stack. Like, it was massive. Like, like a tree. Uh, and he finds a very plain uh, brown book that has kind of something etched in it but it's kind of worn away so he can't really see it he can't tell what the thing is and he's like wow and he, and he picks it up and he opens and his his sister grabs it from him because immediately clovis can tell that it's something he he's interested in and she takes it and he's like oh you won't even be able to read it it's in a language we can't speak but he opens it and on the first page it says he can read it it says ivar don't turn the page i'm in the exchange find me at the bottom um, and he's like, what the fuck? And he's like, oh my God, this is a piece of my missing puzzle. Ah, uh, what the <laughs> heck? Oh my God, heck in mysteries. And then he like, he he's determined finding this makes him determined because he's like, I need to get to the bottom, but there is no bottom. Maybe there's chambers underneath me. So I need to get out again. And he, there's a giant wall of like charred books on one side where obviously there was a giant fire and a huge, very, very thick stack of books, like, like a massive wall of books was the fire block um and they burnt but they kept it from spreading to the rest of the chamber and he had when he was younger dug a tunnel underneath this and got to the door and so he's trying that again and as he's um trying to get through that the soldier so there's two people that are also in there with them they're not really people they're call assistants the, the one is assistant and the other one's the soldier and the assistant is just kind of vaguely female shaped but like an ivory like robot -y lady robot. Who, <laughs> yeah. uh, and then the soldier is like that but more masculine in feature and has a sword and is a really good fighter like uh clovis and uh starville might be really good but like none of them have ever be beat the soldier so he's a uh, heckin good um and the assistant has kind of been like their mother figure and like isn't nurturing uh in most ways but has taken care of them and same with the soldier like there's points where like the soldier is like they have a, a field of crops, like a little where they plant things and there's seeds. The feeling is that there's something more going on inside of them that comes to the surface sometimes, like the assistant held him once when he was sick. Um, but like they're also just automatons. And the book will try to sell it like he's actually very attached to them, but I didn't really feel it. Um, and so he decides like, hey, there's a well here. Maybe that's what they mean by at the bottom. So he goes underwards and he comes out in, I saw this as that place in um, the Chronicles of Narnia in the 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 third book, I think, um, where, or no, the first book chronologically, where like there's a bunch of pools that lead to different worlds. And that's kind of what it is. It's like a big forest and there's a bunch of pools everywhere. And he's like, oh my God, I've read about books, but I've never seen them before. Read about books? I'm sorry, trees. I've read about okay. trees, but I've okay. never <laughs> seen them before. There we go. What? I was like, uh, mm, I don't think you said that right. But yeah, and he's like, wow, this is so cool. And then as he's walking around, he sees uh, uh, this one pool is kind of dark and there's a hand come, coming up through it. And he reaches in and he pulls it out and then we go back to Lavere's 
view uh, really quick. At this point, Livera has been training. She knows how to read now. Her handwriting's still not go that good. She asks lots of questions. She's made a gaggle of friends, and her gaggle of friends have been sent into the actual library because she thought the training library was the library, but it wasn't. They've been sent into the actual library to try to find a book because this one guy who's a dick wants Livera out of there and is trying to get her out of there by having them find an impossible book. So her and her friends go into the library. They're like, be careful not to wander off too far. You can get lost and die in here. And she's like, I don't give a shit about your <laughs> rules or your systems. I shall go where I want. And she literally, like, they're like, Lavira, don't. And she's like, I'm not doing anything. I'm just... Doo -doo -doo. And then she, like, bolts. Yeah. Uh, because she decides she's going to go find an assistant because they talk about how there are assistants in the library who aren't super helpful. But like, she's like, oh my god. And so she runs. She finds a labyrinth. She gets lost in the labyrinth. There is this entire... There are more... There is more space on a page written about her struggles climbing a singular bookshelf than there is in Ivar's character development. I mean, look, I enjoyed that. I enjoy the little, like, details of how she's struggling. Like, she... Like, she... Uh, uh, Lavira is the only person who treats the library like it's a legit playground. Here's the thing about it is that in, you know, in Piranesi, the museum place he's in feels like a real ecosystem. Like it's flooding at parts. There's things on the top. There's birds. Let's never forget the gulls who said hi to him. And he didn't have time to talk to you that one time. And I never really got that sense from the library that actually this is like an enclosed ecosystem onto itself. Um, and I think maybe the author wasn't necessarily trying to go for that. He was going for more of like an eternal untouched place. But like later there was mentioned that there's basically wildfires going through the library constantly. Um, and like that's such a cool idea. And like we just don't really interact with it a lot more than that. I mean, wouldn't it have been interesting if she had, because there's this one concept that's later on explained to us that um, the, the library is like basically forever. And there are sections of the library that only certain species from certain worlds or certain eras or whatever can open. And uh, let, I, I mean, I don't know how you would have explored this part. I mean, I guess an assistant. It's because assistants are supposed to be able to open any door. But like, it, it's mentioned that at all times the library is burning someplace and I guess that's a, that's a very cool like concept of the idea that like it's like you were saying it's an ecosystem basically and from the death there is rebirth but unfortunately the rebirth is secular and people keep killing each other over and over again like that's cool and all but it felt very unfinished and actually i didn't get to mention this before it's because well actually i don't even know how i didn't get to mention this before it's because this is literally the thesis of my entire feelings on this book this book made me depressed and um listening to it made me want to like literally die um and I hated listening to this book. I never want to listen to it again. Why? Katie has huge problems with time and the cyclical nature and nothing ah, matters yes. and nothing is unique. Yes, and... I have that problem too. So there's also like, so there's books like Piranesi where it's kind of vaguely like that, but it's more like at peace with itself. So it's easier on like, the open wound that is my like depression but in this book it's very much like a sharp knife where it's like it's constant we're constantly wounding each other we're constantly like bleeding out and uh, god i hated the dep i hate the concept of forever like i hate it i hate it i hate it so yeah, I no, i know exactly what you mean but this for me did not was not sufficiently good <laughs> to, to trigger it well that's what actually hurts me even more is that if it's good enough then I feel kind of like, oh, this is poetic. Mm, mm. This is really good. Like, so uh, J Japanese media loves to target this particular theme, the idea of like people's connections over time and all that stuff. And as Maria and I call it the Japanese ending for things, it's because <laughs> like, it's like, oh, even though you're dead, our hearts will always be with each other. It's like, no, screw that. The, the beauty of the transient moment thing, that concept that I forget the name of. Like you're saying, no, I don't, like there was something like, it felt like a blanket that was really pretty, but that had a whole bunch of stray little thread pieces everywhere poking out. So it didn't look as pretty as it could have. So it, it just, it looks messy rather than like a beautiful tapestry. And that's the way I felt about the concept or the theme of this. Wait, 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 wait. What did you just say? Tapestry, beautiful tapestry. Ooh. It's tapestry. 
who cares oh my god the bad dream you have at night well what's that called a nightmare okay good some people say nightmare and that's really weird so real quick angry otter makes a point is this a case of too many things or just mismanaging the things that are there i am going to make the argument that it's mismanaging the things that are there um there is a little bit of too many things towards the latter half there is a there is definitely a bit of too many characters at a certain point like there's so many characters and i don't mm -hmm. feel like they get as much attention as they yeah. should and i think kind of thinning the heard especially because like Ivar's side doesn't get like there's not a, not a lot of characters and yet they're not developed at all so the next big thing that happens is that Eva and Lavera meet because Lavera is running from something and she jumps into a thing and at this point she is a small child and he is like oh hey what's up child and she's like precocious and this was the moment where I was like who is this bitch? Like, all of a sudden, she comes off, like, less like um, I'm kind of questioning the world around me and, like, I, I don't stop asking questions and, like, more like Manic Pixie Dream Girl. And obviously not right now because she's a child, but those tendencies grow. And it's a very male author coded way of writing a female character which is so weird because prior to this in her perspective she did not get portrayed like ivar is the same way later on when we get from um, lavira's perspective of ivar as his normal self he doesn't seem like the ivar we were also told so it's not just a female thing it's also just like a portrayal of character thing yeah it, there's a mismatch between the dialogue and the internality i think um and look i get it i also like that kind of a female character but it just felt a little out of place i can see someone making the argument that that's the point their perceptions of each other is not oh uh, like well no that, i think that's like a fault. Th this whole this whole yes i and the thing is i think you could have done it better where maybe they they eventually see how they actually are on the inside you know when you first meet someone and you take the thing they're doing the wrong way and then you get to know them and you're like oh i completely misread that like my boyfriend thought i was really cool and independent and smart <laughs> and 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 real like real real cool no, you shut the fuck I, up yes you are no no i am a giant potato like i'm a squishy bean everyone she's lying people are always more insecure and less adult than you think they are when you yes. meet them. this is a thing exactly. i just had to learn about people but also maria is 85 percent normal functioning adult well she's more like grandma and so i think people read that as functioning adult but she really just skipped that stage towards uh, you know i decorate like a grandma i'm also a baby it's also that she has older sibling syndrome. So oh, like yeah. she older so siblings, hard. literally everyone. So but no, it's totally true. It's the Darcy thing. Sometimes you misjudge people the first time you meet them or you get a different sense for them as you grow. No, that actually would have been a really interesting thing. If the author had to then reconcile the, the that from that first meeting, they had a specific idea of who each other were and then reconcile that that's not actually who it was. I mean, that would require them meeting each other at the same age a couple of times for them to actually, cause like, unfortunately she meets, uh, we'll get there anyway. So, uh, uh, they they have a, a conversation and she's like oh and he was like i i've been stuck in a library with my siblings and she was like oh i'm in the library adventuring and doing stuff and he was she was like what are you doing here and he's like i'm looking for the lady from my memory that i don't remember and he was like she was like oh your girlfriend i hope you find her and then lavira gets pulled like she kind of goes back towards her pool like they, they look they see that all the different pools and like the trees and I don't know. and then she falls back into her pool and she gets pulled through by uh the assistant so when she goes into the the portal there was an assistant there uh whose hand was half into the the thing and the assistant is like just barely more alive but it managed to pull in and take her out and be like the exchange is forbidden to your kind you cannot go in there uh and so she gets pulled in she tries to go back in but she can't and she's like wow i had a weird experience in this other place with a dude that uh, apparently i'm the first person he's uh, ever met before ever and then she goes back to her school stuff and she does some learnings and then we have a time skip into the future so everyone it does address why she doesn't tell everyone about the exchange but does it not infuriate you that we didn't get the scene of her telling them oh by the way and them disbelieving her like it just glossed over and i felt like that was such an important aspect that's not a scene i necessarily wanted but you're kind of right that it's the book is missing skips by some of those scenes to then just bambi about with her friends and like more of him just thinking about what order his friends his brothers and sisters came out of the holodeck like 
you're right that there's weird like missing scenes like that that it skips by which would be okay in a shorter book but in a book this long it feels like weird that we're spending time on other things and bear in mind i listened to this at double speed like this took half the time for me that it would for other people it's 22 hours it's a chonky boy i listened to it at normal speed this one. Oh, i did 1.6 I could not have done. Ooh. I already like struggle multitasking while driving, but that's like the only like I'm in an hour of traffic every morning and evening. So there's like no way I'm not going to listen to it, but I, I can't listen to it at two times while I'm looking at traffic. I will say one day I think I listened to about four or five hours of it in one go in that it is readable again we're spending a lot of time talking about the problems but it does work as a whole we yeah. should we it, should it point really, out more of the positive it really things. does it, it's super enjoyable it's very uh readable or listenable and it's also a bit bingeable like you can pound mm -hmm. away like at several points and, and there is something really compelling about Lavira's like scrappy i'm the underdog and i'm gonna go into the library and become a librarian when she becomes a little older too we start getting fed more information about the city such as the experimentations going on which i thought were going to be explored a little bit more considering how dangerous it is there are actually and, and going to our point about how this book is kind of decent there are actually some really interesting ideas about how the library is used to mitigate power in the city and the king only wants certain books published and not others then if theoretically this is an infinite library then you should just be able to write something and it exists somewhere in the that whole monkey's tap ring however many times so really what's the point of finding the book if you could just write the book yeah um, the thing about it and the problem i had is that this is all very cool but we don't actually see it function in, in mm -mm. the city because we're not actually in the city a lot we're mostly just with her and her friends so we don't really get a sense for the functioning of the culture this is where we have the too many things problem wait wait wait! you got to do a dance you've been doing a dance the last two times it's too many things you got too many things going on and and some of the things that you have going on that is okay because those aren't too bad you, you're not doing as well as you need to and here it is we are given this really fascinating concept of the politics of the city being led by denying certain things only listening to books that agree with you writing the books that will uh fuel what your politics are but it is so periphery to the story that to lay that delicious nugget down at our feet and then to walk away from it and have it feel a little bit underdeveloped there's also the idea of um chemical warfare that uh that comes up here and the problem is it comes up where she there's a point where she her and a friend are exposed to a chemical explosion that is designed to kill her and then later we see a chemical explosion that kills people and i immediately was like she needs to immediately think did we do this we had that i know we had the technology and she doesn't even question it i know at oh all my God. that it is something that humans might have done despite the fact that she has literally had that experience it did not make any sense this could have worked all of these different things could have worked if this book i think had been split into two i was about to say that the thing about this is that this is two different books but go ahead and then i'll explain you have the development and, and her kind of turning into this human that is going to go on this adventure in the last third and kind of do this thing and it, the, the other problem here is that this is already two books this is book one of a duology apparently i think i think there's only two of them it's a trilogy uh, it's a trilogy why, <laughs> why why don't we do standalone books i'm so angry but this is what i was saying before once she turns to a certain age and it starts fast forwarding more and more and more it felt like it was being sh like it literally feels like me trying to and if this one person who knows who they are are listening to this episode it feels like trying to shove a giant comforter into a washing machine or dryer and it just won't fit the chemical thing by the way side note um i wanted to say uh it's really cool because in this scene this one scene um <laughs> in this one scene uh where they are attacked by uh, a chemical weapon uh they actually like almost die <laughs> and uh lavira and uh her friend uh, as well as Mala have to like breathe in this one thing for them to even like remotely reverse the effects. Plus their hair is bleached and like their finger or I don't remember all that's bleached. And I thought, oh, this is going to be a really nice detail to have if this comes up again too. Uh, number one, I, I wanted her to have medical issues. Number one, I, that's just a me thing though. But also number two, 
This entire time, these are all assassination attempts on Lavira's life because she's a duster, but she's in the city doing a respectable job. And this one dude that's like a prat wants to get rid of her. It's because, you know, like racism, racism. And racism. Um, yes. And uh, I'm sorry. He's a big old bad guy, but we never see he never comes on screen again until the end for five seconds. And, and there's a point where he gets humanized to Lavira, like where she realizes oh he's not just a cackling he's a man who's who's fighting to preserve his relevancy in his world and it happens off screen and she's just telling you this thing and and so it's weird because i think splitting this into two books and, and letting and if ivar had had like so either you take ivar out as a point of view and then maybe have the second book from his point of view with a little bit of overlap um or you um and then you just have this in Lavira's point of view, or you actually give Ivar something to do. And this book is just the development of getting them to the point where, like, this stuff is going to kick off for the second book. Um, because you're right, Algar is just a, like, to, he, feels, he, he feels like a boogeyman there to give Lavira's life richness. Uh, rather than someone within his own right. And then, again, there's that entire scene where she digests who he is, that he, his his house has fallen on hard times, that he needs to create legitimacy in his heritage. Otherwise, because he's now poor, he has no fucking value. That his, and, and, and that would shake up his entire world order and, like, that whole thing. And she realizes, oh, he's not a boogeyman. He is just a person with who has some bad motivations and like i don't like him he's not likable but and i'm like that would have been great for us to see fundamentally maria's correct in that this is two different books but they're all it's also two different books thematically springing from the same idea one of these books is if there was an infinite library how would that affect society in terms of like they have access to this knowledge but haven't reached a certain level of social development how would this shape their political system that's so that fantastic one idea and then the other idea is if you had to live in this library on its own and there was a bunch of time magic and it had to do with never meeting anybody but your siblings and your siblings being defined by books because there's nothing else going on. And the thing is, those are two interesting ideas, but they don't come together. So mm -hmm. you're kind of le le left feeling each one is half fed. But but that being said, both are very awesome concepts. Yeah. Uh, well, the first one's way more interesting, honestly. And how great would it have been if we had just gotten basically the first third slash half of this book, but for the whole book and Lavira? Like, that would have been really fun. Also, the idea that society is learning things too quickly and has not mm -hmm. learned the lessons that come with organically learning the thing. Because, like we said, the, the huge thing is they are able to do in a thousand years what humanity took 10,000 years of learning and trial and error and building upon the mistakes of the past to do they're just getting that information so like they're going from like no electricity to electricity like that um very quickly and the implications of what that what does that do how you, you don't you haven't learned the lessons of the power you're dealing with you haven't faced uh the the problems that come out of it because you're just getting the thing so like one example that i think is kind of interesting for is that societies develop different rules based off of how large they are so they've done studies of this there's four specific tiers and i forget which ones they are but like er in early societies you basically everything is a familial relationship there's no idea really of justice or not it's like if you kill my brother i'll kill you and it's there's no sense of like oh okay this is good or bad or one of us had a reason to or not it's entirely reciprocal violence and then as you, that stops working after you're after you can't keep track of people's family relationships and then so you need a certain amount of law involved and then once you get a certain amount of law involved you then get certain other morality concepts and then you need a bureaucracy involved and so like there is a way that societies develop based off of time and so it would be fascinating if like okay but before we even have a concept of justice we have guns you know what i mean yeah like, and a lot of a lot of um technology they refer to as like in the military as like weapon systems you know like the the reason um certain uh, organize certain militaries can use certain weapons even though they had access to these weapons before is because they only now have the training or combined arms to make them effective like i was reading a lot about the spanish tercio 
which is um, the pike and shot kind of formations and how like that actually really only worked particularly well for Spain because it was a specific culture. And so like seeing a mismatch in those would be really interesting, but she's only ever in the library. She has brief scenes outside of the library, but the majority of it is her in there and unraveling the mysteries of the library as this uh, not sentient, but like it, it, infinite, infinite environment of uh, knowledge, but where the the books themselves are not necessarily immortal. One of the things that they do talk about in terms of technology, and we haven't mentioned, is that the Saba are like um, they're massing outside this city. I forget what their city is called, and they're gonna invade, Crap. but they don't have. So, like, one of the big motivations for the library is, like, we got to find better weapons because the Saba just are inherently a lot stronger than humans. Um, and then that will become key in a little bit. Basically, our main character ends up being, like, 13. She finally gets back because, like, she wants to go back into the library and she wants to, like, go back to the exchange and see Ivar and see if he, like, found stuff. Uh, like, the person. And she starts writing. Um, you tells her to kind of look at fiction. So she kind of starts writing her stories and, 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 like, she writes on bits of paper in in random books she writes on like the title sheet or the like rec the uh when you thank people what the acknowledgement sheets and she starts writing stories on them but eventually at the age of 13 she finally is in the position she follows this one librarian into the library who takes her to a place that has a mechanism and she brings a book in with her she has a bad experience but she ends up in her fear in that moment this book that she brings in with her can magically summon darkness that is like straight up, just straight darkness. When you open the book, you can't see anything and it moves with her while she has the book. Can other books do this? <laughs> like, I, I felt like that was a, uh, um, what's it called? Uh, Chekhov's gun, is that what you call it? Yeah. Is that right, the right yes. term? Uh, that I just did not understand why there was only one book discovered that could do that and it was never commented upon. My theory is that the insect people that write this have to have darkness to read like there's th that the book itself is written in the darkness not necessarily in the pages man that is some or extrapolation though that was it is never but explained. it's pure Oof. extrapolation it's not all all you know is that it's a book that when you open creates a bubble of darkness and that the it is written eventually she she finds a mechanism she goes into the mechanism and reads the book and it's about these insectoid people and their war and it's a terrible not very no good very bad day she she comes out of it and she's so scared in it that she summons the raven who was her guide when she first found the portal to get which to we haven't exchange. mentioned at all and also all these animal things i'm like Livera, how did you not notice that the saba probably came before us and this is probably an alien planet and there probably are no humans that was originally i don't know that's what i was thinking at one point i was like the, the head of the library is a giant wolf. How does nobody understand that the Saba probably had this place first? She ends up finding the portal. Uh, she has to move because she can't get into it because the assistant who was lying there, uh, like kind of dead whose hand was in it um she figures out that it, it because of the assistant's hand is in it she can't get into it she moves the assistant like dangles her into the air gets into the the exchange uh our boy is still in there he had just gone he decided to go into a different pool and he saw his sister clovis's uh the day the sabas attacked and she ended up going into the mechanism like he got to experience that and see that happen and it was super no good. He pops out of it and he's like, wow, that that was heavy shit. And then a 13-year-old girl pops out of nowhere and is like, hey, yeah. And he's like, why does this bitch know my name? Like, I don't know her. The last part of time I saw her, she was like nine. And and she's like, it's me, Lavera. Did you find your girlfriend? And he's like, no, and I don't know if she's my girlfriend. And then Lavera in this moment is like, ah, I think these are like, uh, each of these pools goes to different places, blah, blah, blah. And they try to go in one together, Okay. Oh, here, oh, here's Stay the plot me. hole Maria here's discovered. My plot hole. And the one that I did not understand. And maybe if any of you understand it, please explain it to me. Because when this scene, I think this is the poorest written scene in the entire book. So they decide to go into one together. And when they go in, Lavira immediately is hit by acid air. Like it is burning her lungies, her eyes, they be doing the tearings. She's like, ah. She can't find Evar. What was she like? Say that again. I'm not doing it again. It will yeah, well, I missed that it. part. What was it like? No, no. <laughs> you'll you'll see it when you edit. Anyway, so she. I'm gonna she edit jumps... it in, but slower. Yeah, yeah. please do. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> please. Thanks.
and so she pops out. She she gets out and she's like, oh, wow, wow. That was rough. And then Ivar comes back and is like, Lavira, what the fuck happened? Are you okay? And she was like, you didn't get hit by the toxic gas? And he was like, no, it, it was like when I went into my sister's world, I was a ghost uh, in that world. And then they're like, wow, that's weird. And she's like, if you must, if you go into the past so you don't affect it, you probably are just a ghost. But if you go into the future, you can interact with that world and it can affect you. So my lungs were bur burned because it was my future, but it was the past for you. You're so, and your, your little pool is so much farther ahead than mine. So you're like hundreds of the years into the future. And then later the book is going to stare you in the face and it's going to say, if you go to a pool in the future, you can never go back to your own pool. It is now the past for you. If you go into a future one, you are now in the future and that is now your timeline and you can't go back. This bitch goes into the future, gets her lungs burned, and then can go back to her timeline willy-nilly. Big ol' plot holes! I was so confused during that moment. If I had been thinking about it that much, yeah, that would have really bothered me. Um, I didn't, because at a certain point, I was like, this is just time magic. Like, I, there's too many rules for this for me to keep it involved. Um, the time magic stuff in the book is just not super good. I, Angry Otter does make an okay point. I will click on it. Although, I thought the acid world was next to her, so the same time, but a different place. Ah! Uh Perhaps the, the whole point is that the reason you can be affected by stuff and affect stuff when you go forward and but you can't go back maybe it's different if you go to the same time but different place and that's how you can travel between worlds look it's not explained and that's still a fault so regardless it's a plot hole i don't like it it, it unless somebody can point to the where in the text it explains itself it feels like a giant fucking plot hole and the thing is the time stuff i find unnecessary i that has nothing to do with the library being found all the time there's all this timey wimey like i was my own grandfather stuff or your 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 love ends up being your mother in a way yeah like that kind of thing <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. thanks i hate this i would have just preferred minus the time and just do places like that's good enough in my opinion also i really wanted the twist to be like again that this is not earth that this is not a lot like maybe there was an earth at one point but this is so far down the line and they invaded this other planet and that's why and they like ruined all the resources because human is, humans are the roaches of the universe and that type of thing. I, I mean, I know that's not what they was going for, but I mean, to be honest, I actually don't even really like the whole stuff with the Saba and the other people. I actually don't even think. We're two races who are constantly in a fight for survival. I actually don't really like that as a theme, but we don't really have time to get into why. No, I don't so, either. It makes me upset, but whatever. So it's all, it's all a little bit messy. But basically, yeah, they're 13 now. She's 13. He's 20. She's 13. Still. He's still 20. Right. So she's getting and, there. She's almost at the age where he can fuck her. Bah, 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 she's not. First of all, Katie. Um, Nowhere this is near. A Christian podcast. Nowhere near. In, in the state of Illinois. Anyway, they, they come out of the thing and she's like, wow, that, that was an interesting interesting experience uh and then he was like i think i'm gonna use this to try find the so many possibilities Jesus. i was gonna say also in dog ears she's legal but that doesn't count here no. oh my God. <laughs> anyway so he's like i'm going to use these pools to try see what happened to my brother Miland. he was he like he went missing and i don't know if he's dead and i'll i'll because they realize that they are because of their expectations and their like intentions they are guiding the time of the exchange they keep finding each other as they're back in the exchange together and the idea is you can go into the time period you want to go into i got very confused between meland and mayland or whatever the two the friend uh yeah, lavira's it's friend just two very close names i thought that meant something i was waiting this whole time for them to were... be the same person no nope. yes yeah, it immediately goes out the window when the twist happens because, you know, he's like, I'm going to see my brother. And then escapes come and they're like, why the fuck are escapes coming in here? And the escapes go to and he gets to fight. And she's like, wow, he's so powerful. He's such a good fighter. He's so fast. Wow. Oh, that's so hot. My nether regions. And then uh, he the, the escape goes to attack her and she falls back into her world and the escape comes in with her. But it has invaded the assistant that was there and like seeped into her. So now the assistant is like black and it starts chasing her and she has to run out of the library and and she gets out and she closes the cl door closes behind her and she's like wow that was that was close uh and then we're gonna jump until sh she's she's 20 and by the time she's 20 she's she spent the past seven years like 
But, well, it goes to when she's 17, which is when she gets to become a librarian. And, like, the king's like, no, she can't be a librarian. She's a duster. And Newt's like, yes, she can be a librarian. I spoke to the head librarian. And now she's a librarian. And people are trying to kill her still. She goes back. And, again, there's this whole politics thing about, like, her getting to become a librarian. And she's like, you you used me. And he's, and she, he's also like, Lavira. Things are cyclical. Things are not what they seem. You gotta pay attention. We've done this before a hundred of times. Don't get caught. Be sneaky. Maybe the sabers are okay. And she's like, I was with you right until you said that last thing. Because fuck the sabers. Out of nowhere. And at that point, I want everyone to know, that's when I realized, and even though I won't say it right now, what you was. And I was like, hmm, I wonder how we're going to get there. And then I jumped to another thing. And I was like, oh, so the soldier... From which we have almost barely discussed, even though I like was obsessed with it the entire time. The soldier that was with the assistant with Ivar as he grew up. I'm like, huh, I wonder if somehow that's so and so. And that's how that happened. And then I was like, no, I'm really confused. And I'm still confused. And then she goes to the library and she does her stuff. And then we time skip to when she's 20. And basically the thing to learn about her is that she's been continuing to write her magnum opus. And it's basically semi- biographical stuff that happens to her but it's also just her fantasy adventure stories of her and Ivar going on adventure so she has spent the past seven years since she was 13 to 20 being like that guy I, I dream about that guy self-insert fan fiction exactly with another human that's literally what she's doing <laughs> it is self-insert fan fiction and she's like me and Eva went on an adventure and sometimes things got steamy uh and she's just been writing it throughout everywhere politically things are getting a little rough the Sabas are literally outside the city they're going to invade things are uh a little uh not great her and her friend Arpix uh, have she because she finally told Arpix what happened to her and to the library and stuff and and he's been trying to help her get back to the exchange Arpix is a friend we barely mentioned because it doesn't really matter in all the scheme of things despite him being in a lot of the book and Arpix really should have been her husband first and foremost but I'm neither here nor there on that I liked Arpix a lot okay and I was fine with them being buddies but it made a lot more sense for to me if she ended up falling in love with someone she spent half her life with rather than and the five, but you know, like, I guess fantasies really do. The power of the mythological man in your head. Yeah, I don't ship it. I don't ship it. She goes back and she's like 20 now and she meets, um, by the way, this whole time for Eva, it's still been like three minutes and he meets her and she's like hot now. And he's like, who is this lady? And she's like, oh, not this again, which I thought was kind of funny as a line. Um, and now they decide to go to a city together. And by this point, she's full manic pixie girl. Um, and the city they go to is her city, but at a different time period. And it's filled with dead people and not just dead people, dead people and Saba. And they're together. And it looks like it was a gas attack. There was there, there, some people are holding babies. Some people are just chilling, dying, dead in the bed. And they're all in normal people clothing. Nobody's in soldier gear or has weapons. And they're like, OK. That was weird. She's like, fuck the sap. And they killed themselves with their own weapon. And he's like, uh, another thing to mention is he went into another pool prior to this point and he saw this same city, but at a different point in history, but with uh, that had also been invaded by Saba, but it was more like a classic invasion where like the Sabas came over the wall. Um, anyway, and so there, there's also a moment here where she's like, oh, I can make my nails a different color. And he was like, I don't see your nails. It is a different cover, a color. And she's like, what if we're just seeing the expectations of each other? And he doesn't actually know what I look like. And when he actually sees me, he's going to think I'm gross looking. That would suck. That's true, Olivia. You are gross looking to him. It should have been that way anyway. And then they, uh, like, while they're in the city, she sees, like, the... <laughs> a white child like a an, an albino child you mean you mean you uh, instantly you yeah <laughs> uh just scurrying through this and there's this point where they look at each other and he's like nobody should be able to see us we're ghosts i've been in two places where i was a ghost and nobody could see me except for assistance also when they first get to the city there is like a hundred assistants all just on the steps of this like uh, the stairs that is the mouth of a wolf um, and they're all there and there are two pools of assistant blood on the earth because one of the things that happened how uh, she gets back here is she discovers that to open portals you need the blood of an assistant and she has to go and find that dead one that she which found. is a kind of a really cool concept because then are the assistants basically like angels basically like i don't know that would have been fun to play with the more biblical nature of this it's because there is a heavy we haven't really discussed it but there is a massive heavy biblical 
like theme going on in this novel they and there's two pools of assistance blood just on the floor and that's what they've popped out of like they they as portals they because you have to make a circle with the assistance blood but there's just pools of it and so they pop out and then of those. children's footprints leading yes, away into the little city. tiny footprints leading away into the city and you're like oh something weird has happened here like two assistants have gone kaput and then something walked away from that i was spot. like oh they either sacrificed children because at first i didn't catch that it was the assistance blood or i was like or that's you and someone else it's because you it's like all white well you already know because he skipped over this but we we've, we've already seen yamala and we've met valent uh valente uh yamala is the head librarian she's also very white and at first i was like sister uh no it's you it's you's wife um and uh so immediately when there's a point where they see the like white children i'm like oh this is yamala and you like i don't know what's happening but that's a hundred percent what that is but anyway and so she's like wow this stuff because they, they specifically asked to be taken to a time period where there was no fighting and she was like of course all it could show us was them already dead <laughs> and like, can i just say lavira is so <laughs> butthurt in this entire i cannot describe how out of character she felt in this scene. I was like, she got so boring as an adult. And Ivar is like, <laughs> like, this doesn't make sense. What is happening? Like, Ivar is suddenly the reasonable smart one where he's like, hmm, this doesn't make sense. And he's not having the intense reaction Laveria is. Laveria is real fucking pissed. Um, and, uh, like, super angry about it. Another thing we haven't mentioned that's been mentioned in the book several times so that you'll remember it is that Sabas are so terrible, they are now synonymous with foe as a word. And you're originally like, oh, that's cool, an interesting, uh, you know, linguistical thing, uh, world building detail. Uh, it will become relevant shortly. So they go back into the thing uh, and she's like, oh, this is terrible. And, and they're kind of talking. And then all of a sudden Clovis appears and Clovis is like, what a hard switch, by the way. I was so confused in that moment. Also, they kissed when they were in the city. I forgot to mention that. Like they were in the city and they were flying and then they did the smoochy smooching. So they're like, woohoo but then they're like sad and then they come back into the exchange and they're like wow what an experience and then clovis attacks and clovis is like brother how could you you're fornicating with a saba and he's like no you don't you're not seeing her the exchange changes how you see things uh that's not what she's not a and clovis is like you're wrong it might fuck with your eyes but i see clearly and then in that moment lavira real realized that clovis was correct and then you find out that they are not there. She's a human. He's a he's a canis. dog person. And they've both been calling each other like they are both each other Saba because Saba just means enemy. So when they were like, it's the Saba. You think the whole time that the people that attacked Clovis's family uh, were the Saba? No, they were the dog people, but the humans were the ones that attacked. So now they look upon each other. That's a great twist, but I just did not like the execution. It's not a bad twist. It's okay. There are some hints leading up, like I. Kept being like, why are the Saba so inconsistent in their power level? Like, why are sometimes they really strong and other times a human can kill them with a book? And like, then you're like, oh, okay, now it makes sense. Uh, again, I, this human Saba like uh, cycle of violence. I'm not sure why that's the thing we went with. I don't love it for this book, but like, it is it is an interesting idea. So she's like, oh no, and then Clovis is going to get her, and like he, Clovis is literally like stepping on Evar's head, like fuck you. Buddy. Oh yeah, no, doesn't she at one point like? I forget what's described, but he, like, she does some... Okay, I really dislike characters that are on the same side as each other, and then one character's horribly aggressive and just hurts the other person all the time. Yeah, if it's not hot, then it's, then and, it's not And good. so it, I really disliked also, because after this, right, and I'll let Maria continue, but I want to focus on the aggression of this. Uh, it's been mentioned many times that Clothes just beats the shit out of Ivar. And then afterwards, like, she literally beats him to a pulp so bad he loses consciousness and, like, had to be brought to a circle uh, to be mended. And I'm just like, I hate Clovis. I really yeah. do. She goes to attack Lavira, Lavira falls back into her pool. Clovis gets one claw on her. So as Lavira comes through, Arpix is there because her and Arpix went into the exchange together but ended up getting separated. Uh, they've also met Valente, by the way. Valente is one of the guides in the library and he's a black, uh, like a black void wolf. <laughs> uh, you don't see features, you see shape. But he is heckin' goodest boy and very good boy. Um, and uh, so Arpix pops out, and Arpix has just got a handful of books, and he's like, oh, that is great. I had a great then, time shopping. And then he sees Lavira on the floor bleeding out from her leg, and she's like, she's, 
Yeah, she's like, I'm I'm not hurt. And he's like, and she's sitting there like, oh my god, he's a Saba. Oh my god, I kissed a Saba. No wonder, because there's a point where she kisses him and she's like, funny, he's clean shaven, but it felt kind of bristly. And you're like... <laughs> oh, you're right. Mm -hmm. That's funny. Mm -hmm. So we're running up against the time. We started like 20 minutes late, essentially. Um, But why don't I do the thing where I describe what happens till the end of the book and then you guys can go in and backfill it. Okay. And because I don't really understand a lot of this, it's going to go super fast. Uh, uh, Lavira goes back to her time period. Oh no, the Kanith are, the Saba are attacking and they're taking the walls. Yute is like, hey, the only place to hide is in the library. Let's go to the library. They gather a bunch of people and they start running for the library. Um, we find out that actually the Saba have gotten some human like friends people and so they can get into the library as well because what they really want is a library because this whole time there's this thing about like how some bugs are chasing them. Okay, they get into the library, but once they're in the library, they accidentally, it gets on fire. So they're having to run from a fire. By the way, this is like two or three hours from the end of the book. This is a massive part of the book and none of it is important. It's all action, basically. Okay, eventually they find Eva again. Eva and and Lavira are like a little bit like, oh no, they're the enemy, but they get over it so fast and they go towards finding each other hot. Again, uh, it's like they can now see each other and I guess Lavira was a furry this whole time and Eva was whatever the opposite of a furry is, a, a pink skin. Ew, don't call it a pink skin. Naked mole rat. And they're like, okay, and Clovis wants to kill them all, but you is like, stop. I was an assistant. You can't, these are not your true enemies. And like they have... There's this whole stuff about the fire chasing them and how they get out from it. And eventually what happens is that we find... <laughs> We're just going to get so mad at how much I'm going to skip here. Basically, what happens is that um, all of Lavira's books, um, Eva ended up falling to the machine with. And so he has been living no. their lives together. That oh no, God, no, no. 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 She, compiled it. It. she compiled it into one book. Yeah, yeah, sorry. That's what I meant, yes. And that book he fell into the thing with. And that's the thing that that's why she's the woman, even though they didn't spend that much time together. He basically was in her imagination this whole time. He lived through her role play fantasy fan fiction. Yeah, they're so like, ooh, cutie. And there's stuff about like stories and their meaning. And it like wasn't as good as the end of The Hogfather, which I find it hard to say because I didn't like that movie that much. But anyway, and so, so they're like, okay, they live whatever lifetime in the thing, imagination. And then to save her, some of her friends who are going to get murdered, her, um, Lavira and the soldier, who we haven't talked about, but again, he's a fun character, they basically inhabit the machine the assistant machine people things and they get them out but the problem is that they kind of lose themselves in the assistant things like they're not really able to think very far it's because the assistants don't really they exist outside of time so Lavira and Malar which I called it not the okay. Lavira part but the Malar part I, I this is not part of the six minutes well. this is not part of the six minutes and so basically what happens is that it sets up a time loop the Kana, the the Saba who are chasing them become the ancestors who then become the four kids um, and she was the assistant the whole time so so she is both his mother and his lover. Super cool. And then earlier in the book, they had been let out. <laughs> they had they had opened up one of the chambers. And so now we see that, oh, no. And, and the assistant and the soldier had gone to fight the, the insect people. And so now we're like, okay, now we're caught up back to the present. We have to find Lavera. She's been in this machine this whole time. And then the book ends. Okay, that was close to it. That was actually not bad, Maria. No, you have that to was not. No, he, he fucked up timelines. <laughs> it doesn't matter. The effects it were doesn't terrible. Matter. No, my goal when I tell the plot is that someone who has not <laughs> listened or read the book can follow. Nothing about that was followable. You're getting a firsthand experience of how it felt to read this book. No. It's actually funny because when I finished this book, I was like, oh, okay, it's good Maria's here because I really just did not like figure it. I was not paying enough attention to really follow what's going on. People won't know I'm dumb because I'll just let Maria explain it. <laughs> no, it's just, look, everyone, it just, the pace at that point, once we get revealed, so um, Lavira goes back into her own time with Mala, but of course, as we've already stated, if you go into the future, which they had in order to heal Mala, it's because his library was not on fire and hers was, and Mala was gonna die because Clovis attacked him because he's a human. Once we get to this point where like things are starting to come together, it's literally everyone. Like I, with the way the pacing was before, I would have expected that her experience inside of the assistant would have been prolonged to some degree and we would have had like some like poetic little moments where like some weird timey-wimey things happen and like all that stuff but i like somebody else also said 
Um, Thea said I was not sold on the mother thing. I was not terrible. sold. It was at terrible. All. It did not because there are several times where the assistant uh, that Lavira is supposedly within the body of is kind of aggressive towards Lavira and is like nasty towards her. And I was like, oh, but she wasn't the assistant yet. She wasn't in the assistant. When they go and they uh, go into his timeline and she's open to the door and they run back. The assistant gets angry and eyes turn red as she turns to Lavira and is like, you opened the door. And then there was a couple of other little, like little moments where there's like this, uh, You maybe I read into it too much and it's not actually passive aggression, but it did certainly come off that way. And uh, just in like one or two other moments, so it's not like there's a littering of a whole bunch of moments where this happens, but it, so when it was revealed that Lavira was actually within the body of the future assistant, I was like, I don't see that foreshadowing at all like there was just like none of that now Malaz on the other Malar, hand Malar hardcore well set up oh yes the minute he said and if you hurt her i'll kill you i was like it's fucking Malar it's Malar i don't know why Malar is here i don't know why he's in this body somehow Malar went from a per and i thought like maybe he chose to like immortalize himself like like a sword heart sword heart style that's exactly someone. what I thought was going to happen. And that shit didn't happen. I hated that Lavira was the assistant. I was okay with it. I, by that point, I was very like, okay. I knew the assistant was going to probably be her. And so I was like, okay, that's fine. It's whatever. I, I, I think it's fine. Mostly because she wasn't really like the assistant the whole time. She was really like inside the assistant, but not really there. Yeah. She, she was really just in hat, like, Stuck. hanging out there hermit crab style what i want to focus on is the idea of lavira's book because the book that wouldn't burn not that will mentioned this at all but it's the title of the thing not important the book the book it's that not. didn't burn it's apparently super important to the next book so it's vaguely important uh is lavira's book because lavira brings her book into the future with her so from the past into the future uh, it becomes its own, like, like it's out of time in a really weird way. So there's a point where she's taken her book, which she took into the future, touched to uh, Ivar's, and then they kind of merge. Uh, so that, because Ivar's book had more stories than she had written in hers yet. So they kind of merge and become a weird timey-wimey thing. And there's a point where they go back to her timeline where she is now a ghost, but her book is still present because it is still a book of the library. Uh, and there's a point where uh, it, it doesn't burn and it can't burn because it is a part of the future. And, and, and it is a, a future, it exists in the future, so it cannot burn now. Which is a cool concept. It is, but I don't like the whole, how did Ivar end up going into the machine with this, the mechanism with this book? And why when he left the mechanism, why was the book on the top of a giant bookshelf and then it's only so happened that he bumped into it and all the books fell? Everybody else knows what the book they went in was and they also remember what happened mm -hmm. during that. Why does he not remember his book experience? He should have had the book from the beginning and not and not have ever turned to the page because it said not to, but he's still stuck and he doesn't know what to do with it. The whole arc of his character is becoming active enough to actually turn the page and not just listen to the yeah. goddamn thing on the page. And anyway, so it just, I don't like that. I don't like it because there's this idea that the stories are being written with the two of them where they are experiencing these stories together. And I don't love that. Like there's a point where when Lavira goes into the assistant, she picks up the book and she sees a story that she's written but Ivar kind of is interacting with her at the same time and it gets really timey-wimey wibbly-wobbly um and it it doesn't work and it doesn't have the emotional impact um that it should have had oh god that's a horrible concept Thea why did you say that oh god I oh, I hate that remember concept. It because Lavira hadn't written it yet so it is timey-wimey but she had no but the future stuff that she didn't write Oh God, that hurts my brain. No, but she would have had to. She she was the assistant this whole time. She hadn't written anything else. The version he, he went into the mechanism with. It has been written up until that point by her. Yeah. Okay, so the thing is, a lot of the time stuff just doesn't super make sense to the reader. It may make sense in the author. To the, like It may theoretically make sense, but in terms of how it is communicated to the reader, it really doesn't make a ton of sense. And it's very hard to follow. And it kind of, you really do lose 
a lot of the human stakes and the character stakes in trying to conform to this time circle that I just didn't think was necessary. Like, this isn't really a story about time. This is a story about the library and literature. And again, Eva's story is about weird time stuff, but the story I was more interested in was in how the library affected people. And societies. The, the whole nine yards. The ending is really breakneck. Uh, and unfortunately, the emotional stakes, because the romance isn't as developed, because there's this whole point where he, he finds her. He has to go back to his time because he the last time he saw the assistant that he grew up with, him and Lavira had been running away and they left the assistant and the soldier to deal with some bug people. Um, and at the end, when he realizes, oh my god, Lavera is the assistant, he's like, I abandoned her to some bug people, she might be dead. And he's like, he's going to rescue her. And he's like, I'm coming, I'm coming, baby, I got you. And he finds her, and she's shattered on the floor and obviously dead. And he's like, no, <laughs> she's dead. How could this happen? And, and here's the thing, I thought maybe we were going to leave a beat for some emotional reaction, but immediately- and All of his siblings come out, and they're like, yo, we actually know where your girlfriend is. But scene. no, not that, not that. It's the ghost of Malar and, and her being like, aww. And Malar's being like, that's a little hectic. And she's like, well, he does love me. And and then they're like, why is he <laughs> running? Why isn't he running away? Why is he fighting the monsters? And it just saps all the tension out of it. But also the emotional reaction, because there's a moment where you as the reader are like, did she actually die? And I actually thought that would be really interesting. If that she's would dead and now we can only interact with past versions of her, mm -hmm. you know? that kind of thing and like but it, this would make it a sad moment and there's this moment where you're like is she dead is she dead and and you're not as sad as you should be because the love between you're not as sad you're sad for your version of lavira that you've grown for but you're not sad for ivar that much because he literally met this woman 24 hours ago as her <laughs> current self like the 20 year old version of her he's only known for maybe 20 hours so you're not and yes he now has the memories of the book but again the memories in the book are just stories lavira wrote they are not real things now you absolutely can grow to love something through stories how many of us have fallen for uh men or women that don't exist how many of us have gotten so uh wrapped up in a world that we finished the book and we're sad even though it was a good ending we're sad because it's done and so like that is entirely possible but again there needs to be a moment where you're reconciling the fact that she wrote m most of the stories in that book based on a version of ivar that wasn't ivar it was just her idea of him from when she was 13 well, and the other thing is, we don't, we never saw that version with him. We see, like, a chapter of him hanging out there, so we don't feel what he felt. We don't grow to love this fictional version of their life together. Um, And so, like, it, it's, and, you know, again, this is not a bad book, except for, like, I don't know, the last two hours were kind of just hard to get through and didn't make a ton of sense. Because I was just like, okay, can the fire ca catch them already? Can we just be done with this? Why is this action scene going on for so long? Yeah, it felt like it was really being drawn out, and but, but, it, but fast forward. It was drawn out fast forward, so it was not, like, enjoyable. And everybody lives. So there's a, a thing that happens in um, the first season of the rebooted or the like new who um, with the uh, oh, Eccleston doctor uh, where the prior to this one episode, the doctor and Rose are not able to save everyone. They just have to accept the fact that people are going to die. And, and, and that, and in this one episode, episode, uh, they managed to save everyone. And it is a, an absolute, it's a, it's one of the best episodes. Katie, what the fuck are you talking about? I actually have no idea what episode you're talking about. The gas <laughs> just mask making one. Faces. The gas mask one. Oh yeah, no, that's was, great. Yeah, no, yeah. that's great. And, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just fucking with you, Maria. But there's literally a point where like, he's like, everybody lives and it's this great moment. And you as the uh, viewer care because we've seen people die and them not be able to save everyone. But here, everybody lives. And I'm like, could we not even have had Carlock die? Could no one die? Like, she saves all of her friends, every single one of them. And you're like, not one. We couldn't have just had one person die. And, and, then, technically... and, then thought, and then I thought, ah, 
the Vera was the coin she spent. She spent herself to yep. save everyone else, yep. and she had to die. But that's not what happens either. Nope, not at all. No, they're alive. They're going to be fine at the end. They just have to go back through the exchange. I would have really loved if Mala and... like I, Also, can we just say Mala's character completely changes in the last little bit, too? Like, he doesn't seem like himself at all, just like everyone else. But also, like... I really was hoping that she had died and like you said, only the past versions of her or a past version of her could be like accessed. But I guess it makes sense that she wouldn't. It's because she didn't really die. Her soul, her ghost was just stuck in there. But wait, but wait, hold on a second. If the ghost was stuck in there in the past and it was stuck until the present, wouldn't at this point, wouldn't she be solid? No, because she's still inside the assistant, I think. No, but once the assistant breaks and she's outside the assistant. Yeah, I think she's so far in the future, like, it's not actually, like, from when she went in, so she went in during her time period. So I don't know. I think she's going to go back into the exchange. It doesn't actually make sense, but I think she's going to go back into the exchange and it's fine. And it'll be like, hi, it's Livia. Uh, nice to see you. Yeah, this is not one of those books that has that kind of, like, bittersweet oh no we'll never meet again in paris kind of a thing the one thing i we haven't really brought up is that the writing style and the prose are good and they're fairly strong but a they're not super strong and b he has this habit of having his characters think about big concepts one of the things i said about um diana Wynne jones is that often she has a way of phrasing something that makes you think about a concept in a way different than you did before um you're like oh wow i've never thought of it that way but it feels so true <laughs> He keeps doing like a budget version of that where he'll have his characters kind of think about something philosophical, but you're like, yeah, but this is not a particularly smart way of putting it or it's not annoying in the way that some of the books we've read get very pretentious about it. But it's like uh, like a lot with this book. It's OK, but it's not great. I enjoyed it. And I think it is of the books we've read for this channel. I, I would say it's one of the better ones we've read, but it for me. It was very frustrating because it felt like there was a lot of potential and the stuff that I was really interested in and the book wasn't. And and then the, the things that the book did, like when it was like, no, I'm forging my path. I don't know that it necessarily did all of it. I will say that it is, I would probably read the second book if it was not like, it, to read the second book, it would have to be for this podcast because it is too long to sneak in between. Like there are some sequels I can sneak in between because they're shorter, um, and I can, like, listen to them between Saturday and Sunday evening. Like, once we do a recording <laughs> Saturday morning and Sunday night is my time period where I'm, like, free and I can listen to something else. it takes me too long to pick the next book. And I'm like, do, 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 let me wait. And so in that nice little window, I've just, there are some times where I don't even ask him if the next book is ready. I'm just like, I'm going to assume and I'm just going to take my little window and I can read stuff. But there's no way uh, where I could. I can't read the sequel unless it's required of me. I, the problem is it's, it's not that it was poorly written or anything like i said i really liked it i was really engaged but there's a certain like the themes that are encapsulated in this book and the way it's executed just make me like i feel like i'm um like i'm i've on the edge of not being able to hold my breath anymore anxiety it makes me anxious it gives me anxiety yes well, and it's not such book. a sufficiently good book that it's worth the price you know this isn't the priest's tale i think mark lawrence is a good writer i'm actually kind of more curious to go read some of his other stuff i kind of want to look at his prince of nothing series again because that was written in a very different style i think maybe this was just a too many things in too large a package problem i think one of the things that it, it made us a little bit or at least made me more charitable this to this book is it's not a YA or romanticy, and yes. so like it was just nice not running into the tropes that you did. Oh, feel. yeah. Whereas if we had spent two years reading guy books about fantasy, maybe we wouldn't have liked it as much, or we That's would have true. found some of these things more annoying. So I'm 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 wondering how much of that played into it. Yeah, like we finally just went into a different genre. <laughs> yeah, I think probably a little bit, but probably not that as much as you might be suspicious. Sus sus uh, suspecting because if it was truly i think we've read enough of like some mixed genre stuff to be like yeah yeah no that this is a big really this is not great to read yeah i think we probably would have been a little bit harsher but still would have said that overall it was pretty good because we tend to be pretty objective despite what the internet thinks um okay any last thoughts <laughs> if if you've read the sequel let us know what you think about it below oh my god yeah please tell us if it's worth it are there other books by male authors that you would suggest we are really tired of the female ones and it was nice to read something different by written by a man with a testosterone <laughs> Putting what Will said aside, actually, I would be very interested in reading more male books. So, or just like not, not. I would, I would. I, I'm, I'm ready now. Something that's she not wants YA less romance. romance. 
Yeah, yes. something that's not YA or romanticy would be nice. Um, so uh, yeah, let us know in the comments below. And as always, uh, you can join our Patreon. We love you, our parasocial darlings. Bye. Bye. Bye.